Part 2, Chapter 1 So he lay a very long while. Now and then he seemed to wake up, and at such moments he noticed that it was far into the night, but it did not occur to him to get up. At last he noticed that it was beginning to get light. He was lying on his back, still dazed from his recent oblivion. Fearful, despairing cries rose shrilly from the street, sounds which he heard every night. Indeed, under his window after two o'clock, they woke him up now. Oh, the drunken man are coming out of the taverns, he thought, it's past two o'clock, and at once he leapt up, as though someone had pulled him from the sofa. What? Past two o'clock. He sat down on the sofa and instantly recollected everything, all at once, in one flash. He recollected everything. For the first moment he thought he was going mad. A dreadful chill came over him, but the chill was from the fever that had begun long before in his sleep. Now he was suddenly taken with violent shivering, so that his teeth chattered and all his limbs were shaking. He opened the door and began listening everything in the house was asleep. With amazement he gazed at himself and everything in the room around him, wondering how he could have come in the night before without fastening the door, and have flung himself on the sofa without undressing, without even taking his hat off. It had fallen off and was lying on the floor near his pillow. If anyone had come in, what would he have thought? That I'm drunk, but he rushed to the window. There was light enough, and he began hurriedly looking himself all over from head to foot. All his clothes were there no traces. But there was no doing it like that. Shivering with cold, he began taking off everything and looking over again. He turned everything over to the last threads and rags, and mistrusting himself, went through his search three times. But there seemed to be nothing, no trace, except in one place, where some thick drops of congealed blood were clinging to the frayed edge of his trousers. He picked up a big clasp knife and cut off the frayed threads. There seemed to be nothing more. Suddenly he remembered that the purse and the things he had taken out of the old woman's box were still in his pockets. He had not thought till then of taking them out and hiding them. He had not even thought of them while he was examining his clothes. What next? Instantly he rushed to take them out and fling them on the table. When he had pulled out everything and turned the pocket inside out to be sure there was nothing left, he carried the whole heap to the corner. The paper had come off the bottom of the wall and hung there in tatters. He began stuffing all the things into the hole under the paper, therein, all out of sight, and the purse too. He thought gleefully, getting up and gazing blankly at the hole which bulged out more than ever. Suddenly he shuddered all over with horror. My God, he whispered in despair, what's the matter with me? Is that hidden? Is that the way to hide things? He had not reckoned on having trinkets to hide. He had only thought of money, and so had not prepared a hiding place. But now, now, what am I glad of? He thought, is that hiding things? My reasons deserting mass simply. He sat down on the sofa in exhaustion and was at once shaken by another, unbearable fit of shivering. Mechanically he drew from a chair beside him his old student's winter coat, which was still warm though almost in rags covered himself up with it and once more sank into drowsiness and delirium. He lost consciousness. Not more than five minutes had passed when he jumped up a second time and at once pounced in a frenzy on his clothes again. How could I go to sleep again with nothing done? Yes, yes, I have not taken the loop off the armhole. I forgot it, forgot a thing like that. Such a piece of evidence. He pulled off the noose hurriedly cut it to pieces and threw the bits among his linen under the pillow. Pieces of torn linen couldn't rouse suspicion. Whatever happened, I think not, I think not, anyway. He repeated, standing in the middle of the room, and with painful concentration he fell to gazing about him again, at the floor and everywhere, trying to make sure he had not forgotten anything. The conviction that all his faculties, even memory, and the simplest power of reflection were failing him, began to be an insufferable torture. Surely it isn't beginning already. Surely it isn't my punishment coming upon me. It is. The frayed rags he had cut off his trousers were actually lying on the floor in the middle of the room where anyone coming in would see them. What is the matter with me? He cried again, like one distraught. Then a strange idea entered his head, that, perhaps, all his clothes were covered with blood, that, perhaps, there were a great many stains, but that he did not see them, 
did not notice them because his perceptions were failing, were going to pieces, his reason was clouded. Suddenly he remembered that there had been blood on the purse too. Oh, then there must be blood on the pocket too, for I put the wet purse in my pocket. In a flash he had turned the pocket inside out and, yes, there were traces, stains on the lining of the pocket. So my reason has not quite deserted me, so I still have some sense and memory. Since I guessed it of myself, he thought triumphantly, with a deep sigh of relief. It's simply the weakness of fever, a moment's delirium, and he tore the whole lining out of the left pocket of his trousers. At that instant the sunlight fell on his left boot, on the sock which poked out from the boot, he fancied there were traces. He flung off his boots, traces indeed. The tip of the sock was soaked with blood. He must have unwarily stepped into that pool. But what am I to do with this now? Where am I to put the sock and rags and pocket? He gathered them all up in his hands and stood in the middle of the room, in the stove. But they would ransack the stove first of all, burn them. But what can I burn them with? There are no matches even. No, better go out and throw it all away somewhere. Yes, better throw it away, he repeated, sitting down on the sofa again. And at once, this minute, without lingering, but his head sank on the pillow instead. Again the unbearable icy shivering came over him, again he drew his coat over him, and for a long while, for some hours, he was haunted by the impulse to go off somewhere at once, this moment, and fling it all away, so that it may be out of sight and done with, at once, at once. Several times he tried to rise from the sofa, but could not. He was thoroughly waked up at last by a violent knocking at his door. Open, do, are you dead or alive? He keeps sleeping here, shouted Nastasya, banging with her fist on the door. For whole days together he's snoring here like a dog. A dog he is too. Open I tell you, it's past ten. Maybe he's not at home, said a man's voice. Ha, huh, that's the porter's voice. What does he want? He jumped up and sat on the sofa. The beating of his heart was a positive pain. Then who can have latched the door, retorted Nastasya. He's taken to bolting himself in, as if he were worth stealing. Open, you stupid, wake up. What do they want? Why the porter, all's discovered. Resist or open, come what may. He half rose, stooped forward and unlatched the door. His room was so small that he could undo the latch without leaving the bed. Yes, the porter and Nastasia were standing there. Nastasia stared at him in a strange way. He glanced with a defiant and desperate air at the porter, who without a word held out a grey folded paper sealed with bottle wax. A notice from the office, he announced, as he gave him the paper. From what office? A summons to the police office, of course. You know which office? To the police. What for? How can I tell? You're sent for, so you go. The man looked at him attentively, looked round the room, and turned to go away. He's downright ill observed Nastasia, not taking her eyes off him. The porter turned his head for a moment. He's been in a fever since yesterday, she added. Raskolnikov made no response and held the paper in his hands, without opening it. Don't you get up then, Nastasia went on compassionately, seeing that he was letting his feet down from the sofa. You're ill, and so don't go, there's no such hurry. What have you got there? He looked. In his right hand he held the shreds he had cut from his trousers the sock, and the rags of the pocket. So he had been asleep with them in his hand. Afterwards reflecting upon it, he remembered that half waking up in his fever, he had grasped all this tightly in his hand and so fallen asleep again. Look at the rags he's collected and sleeps with them, as though he has got hold of a treasure and Nastasia went off into a hysterical giggle. Instantly he thrust them all under his great coat and fixed his eyes intently upon her. Far as he was from being capable of rational reflection at that moment, he felt that no one would behave like that with the person who was going to be arrested. But the police, you'd better have some tea. Yes, I'll bring it, there's some left. No, I'm going, I'll go at once, he muttered, getting onto his feet. Why, you'll never get downstairs. Yes, I'll go. As you please, she followed the porter out. At once he rushed to the light to examine the sock and the rags. There are stains, but not very noticeable, all covered with dirt, and rubbed and already discolored. 
No one who had no suspicion could distinguish anything Nastasya from a distance could not have noticed. Thank God. Then, with a tremor, he broke the seal of the notice and began reading. He was a long while reading before he understood. It was an ordinary summons from the district police station to appear that day at half past nine at the office of the district superintendent. But when has such a thing happened? I never have anything to do with the police. And why just today? He thought in agonizing bewilderment. Good God, only get it over soon. He was flinging himself on his knees to pray, but broke into laughter not at the idea of prayer, but at himself. He began, hurriedly dressing. If I'm lost, I'm lost. I don't care. Shall I put the sock on? He suddenly wondered. It will get dustier still and the traces will be gone. But no sooner had he put it on than he pulled it off again in loathing and horror. He pulled it off, but reflecting that he had no other socks, he picked it up and put it on again and again he laughed. That's all conventional, that's all relative, merely a way of looking at it, he thought in a flash, but only on the top surface of his mind, while he was shuddering all over. There, I've got it on, I have finished by getting it on, but his laughter was quickly followed by despair. No, it's too much for me, he thought. His legs shook. From fear, he muttered. His head swam and ached with fever. It's a trick. They want to decoy me there and confound me over everything. He mused. As he went out onto the stairs, the worst of it is I'm almost lightheaded. I may blurt out something stupid on the stairs. He remembered that he was leaving all the things just as they were in the hole in the wall. And very likely, it's on purpose to search when I'm out, he thought, and stopped short. But he was possessed by such despair, such cynicism of misery, if one may so call it, that with a wave of his hand he went on, only to get it over. In the street the heat was insufferable again, not a drop of rain had fallen all those days. Again dust, bricks and mortar, again the stench from the shops and pothouses, again the drunken men, the Finnish peddlers and half-broken down cabs. The sun shone straight in his eyes, so that it hurt him to look out of them and he felt his head going round as a man in a fever is apt to feel when he comes out into the street on a bright sunny day. When he reached the turning into the street, in an agony of trepidation he looked down it at the house and at once averted his eyes. If they question me, perhaps I'll simply tell, he thought, as he drew near the police station. The police station was about a quarter of a mile off. It had lately been moved to new rooms on the fourth floor of a new house. He had been once for a moment in the old office but long ago. Turning in at the gateway, he saw on the right a flight of stairs which a peasant was mounting with a book in his hand. A house porter, no doubt. So then, the office is here, and he began ascending the stairs on the chance. He did not want to ask questions of anyone. I'll go in, fall on my knees, and confess everything he thought, as he reached the fourth floor. The staircase was steep, narrow and all sloppy with dirty water. The kitchens of the flats opened onto the stairs and stood open almost the whole day, so there was a fearful smell and heat. The staircase was crowded with porters going up and down with their books under their arms, policemen, and persons of all sorts and both sexes. The door of the office, too, stood wide open. Peasants stood waiting within. There, too, the heat was stifling and there was a sickening smell of fresh paint and stale oil from the newly decorated rooms. After waiting a little, he decided to move forward into the next room. All the rooms were small and low-pitched. A fearful impatience drew him on and on. No one paid attention to him. In the second room some clerk sat writing, dressed hardly better than he was, and rather a queer-looking set. He went up to one of them. What is it? He showed the notice he had received. You are a student? The man asked, glancing at the notice. Yes, formerly a student. The clerk looked at him, but without the slightest interest. He was a particularly unkempt person with the look of a fixed idea in his eye. There would be no getting anything out of him, because he has no interest in anything, thought Raskolnikov. Go in there to the head clerk, said the clerk, pointing towards the furthest room. He went into that room fourth in order. It was a small room and packed full of people, rather better dressed than in the outer rooms. Among them were two ladies. One, poorly dressed in mourning, sat at the table opposite the chief clerk, writing something at his dictation. The other, a very stout, buxom woman with a purplish red, 
blotchy face excessively smartly dressed with a brooch on her bosom as big as a saucer was standing on one side apparently waiting for something. Raskolnikov thrust his notice upon the head clerk. The latter glanced at it, said, wait a minute, and went on attending to the lady in mourning. He breathed more freely. It can't be that. By degrees he began to regain confidence. He kept urging himself to have courage and be calm. Some foolishness, some trifling carelessness, and I may betray myself. Hermit's a pity there's no air here, he added. It's stifling. It makes one's head dizzier than ever and one's mind to he was conscious of a terrible inner turmoil. He was afraid of losing his self-control. He tried to catch at something and fix his mind on it, something quite irrelevant, but he could not succeed in this at all. Yet the head clerk greatly interested him. He kept hoping to see through him and guess something from his face. He was a very young man, about two and twenty, with a dark mobile face that looked older than his years. He was fashionably dressed and foppish, with his hair parted in the middle, well combed and pomaded, and wore a number of rings on his well-scrubbed fingers and a gold chain on his waistcoat. He said a couple of words in French to a foreigner who was in the room, and said them fairly correctly. Luce Ivanovna, you can sit down, he said casually to the gaily dressed, purple-faced lady, who was still standing as though not venturing to sit down, though there was a chair beside her. Itch dank, said the latter, and softly, with a rustle of silk she sank into the chair. Her light blue dress trimmed with white lace floated about the table like an air balloon and filled almost half the room. She smelt of scent, but she was obviously embarrassed at filling half the room and smelling so strongly of scent, and though her smile was impudent as well as cringing, it betrayed evident uneasiness. The lady in mourning had done at last, and got up. All at once, with some noise, an officer walked in very jauntily, with a peculiar swing of his shoulders at each step. He tossed his cockaded cap on the table and sat down in an easy chair. The small lady positively skipped from her seat on seeing him and fell to curtsying in a sort of ecstasy. But the officer took not the smallest notice of her, and she did not venture to sit down again in his presence. He was the assistant superintendent. He had a reddish mustache that stood out horizontally on each side of his face and extremely small features, expressive of nothing much except a certain insolence. He looked askance and rather indignantly at Raskolnikov. He was so very badly dressed, and in spite of his humiliating position, his bearing was by no means in keeping with his clothes. Raskolnikov had unwarily fixed a very long and direct look on him, so that he felt positively affronted. What do you want? He shouted, apparently astonished that such a ragged fellow was not annihilated by the majesty of his glance. I was summoned by a notice Raskolnikov faltered. For the recovery of money due from the student, the head clerk interfered hurriedly, tearing himself from his papers. Here. And he flung Raskolnikov a document and pointed out the place. Read that. Money. What money? Thought Raskolnikov, but then it's certainly not that and he trembled with joy. He felt sudden, intense, indescribable relief. A load was lifted from his back. And pray, what time were you directed to appear, sir? Shouted the assistant superintendent, seeming for some unknown reason more and more aggrieved. You are told to come at nine, and now it's twelve. The notice was only brought me a quarter of an hour ago, Raskolnikov answered loudly over his shoulder. To his own surprise he, too, grew suddenly angry and found a certain pleasure in it. And it's enough that I have come here ill with fever. Kindly refrain from shouting. I'm not shouting. I'm speaking very quietly. It's you who are shouting at me. I'm a student and allow no one to shout at me. The assistant superintendent was so furious that for the first minute he could only splutter inarticulately. He leapt up from his seat. Be silent. You are in a government office. Don't be impudent, sir. You're in a government office, too, cried Raskolnikov, and you're smoking a cigarette as well as shouting, so you are showing disrespect to all of us. He felt an indescribable satisfaction at having said this. The head clerk looked at him with a smile. The angry assistant superintendent was obviously disconcerted. That's not your business, he shouted at last with a natural loudness. Kindly make the declaration demanded of you. Show him, Alexander Grigorievich. There is a complaint against you. You don't pay your debts. 
You're a fine bird. But Raskolnikov was not listening now. He had eagerly clutched at the paper in haste to find an explanation. He read it once and a second time and still did not understand. What is this? He asked the head clerk. It is for the recovery of money on an IOU, a writ. You must either pay it with all expenses, costs and so on, or give a written declaration when you can pay it, and at the same time an undertaking not to leave the capital without payment, and nor to sell or conceal your property. The creditor is at liberty to sell your property and proceed against you according to the law. But I am not in debt to anyone. That's not our business. Here, an IOU for a hundred and fifteen rubles, legally attested and due for payment, has been brought us for recovery, given by you to the widow of the assessor Zarnitsyn nine months ago, and paid over by the widow Zarnitsyn to one Mr. Chabarov. We therefore summon you, hereupon, but she is my landlady. And what if she is your landlady? The head clerk looked at him with a condescending smile of compassion, and at the same time with a certain triumph, as at a novice under fire for the first to me as though he would say, Well, how do you feel now? But what did he care now for an IOU, for a writ of recovery? Was that worth worrying about now? Was it worth attention even? He stood, he read, he listened, he answered, he even asked questions himself, but all mechanically. The triumphant sense of security, of deliverance from overwhelming danger, that was what filled his whole soul that moment without thought for the future, without analysis, without suppositions or surmises, without doubts and without questioning. It was an instant of full, direct, purely instinctive joy, but at that very moment something like a thunderstorm took place in the office. The assistant superintendent, still shaken by Raskolnikov's disrespect, still fuming and obviously anxious to keep up his wounded dignity, pounced on the unfortunate smart lady, who had been gazing at him ever since he came in with an exceedingly silly smile. You shameful hussy, he shouted suddenly at the top of his voice. The lady in mourning had left the office. What was going on at your house last night? Eh? A disgrace again. You're a scandal to the whole street. Fighting and drinking again. Do you want the house of correction? Why, I have warned you ten times over that I would not let you off the eleventh. And here you are again, again, you, you. The paper fell out of Raskolnikov's hands, and he looked wildly at the smart lady who was so unceremoniously treated. But he soon saw what it meant, and at once began to find positive amusement in the scandal. He listened with pleasure, so that he longed to laugh and left all his nerves were on edge. Ilya Petrovich. The head clerk was beginning anxiously, but stopped short, for he knew from experience that the enraged assistant could not be stopped except by force. As for the smart lady, at first she positively trembled before the storm, but, strange to say, the more numerous and violent the terms of abuse became, the more amiable she looked, and the more seductive the smiles she lavished on the terrible assistant. She moved uneasily, and curtsied incessantly, waiting impatiently for a chance of putting in her word, and at last she found it. There was no sort of noise or fighting in my house, Mr. Captain. She patted all at once, like peas dropping, speaking Russian confidently, though with a strong German accent, and no sort of scandal, and his honor came drunk, and it's the whole truth I am telling, Mr. Captain, and I am not to blame. Mine is an honorable house, Mr. Captain, and honorable behavior, Mr. Captain, and I always, always dislike any scandal myself. But he came quite tipsy, and asked for three bottles again, and then he lifted up one leg, and began playing the piano forty with one foot, and that is not at all right in an honorable house, and he gans broke the piano, and it was very bad manners indeed, and I said so, and he took up a bottle and began hitting everyone with it, and then I called the porter, and Carl came, and he took Carl and hit him in the eye, and he hit Henriette in the eye, too, and gave me five slaps on the cheek, and it was so ungentlemanly in an honorable house, Mr. Captain, and I screamed, and he opened the window over the canal, and stood in the window, squealing like a little pig. It was a disgrace. The idea of squealing like a little pig at the window into the street. Fire upon him, and Carl pulled him away from the window by his coat. And it is true, Mr. Captain, he tore sign rock. And then he shouted that man must pay him fifteen rubles damages. And I did pay him, Mr. 
Captain, five rubles for Sign Rock, and he is an ungentlemanly visitor and caused all the scandal. I will show you up, he said, for I can write to all the papers about you. Then he was an author. Yes, Mr. Captain, and what an ungentlemanly visitor in an honorable house. Now then, enough. I have told you already, Ilya Petrovich. The head clerk repeated significantly. The assistant glanced rapidly at him. The head clerk slightly shook his head. So I tell you this, most respectable Luce Ivanovna, and I tell it you for the last time, the assistant went on. If there is a scandal in your honorable house once again, I will put you yourself in the lockup, as it is called in polite society. Do you hear? So a literary man, an author took five rubles for his coattail in an honorable house. A nice set, these authors. And he cast a contemptuous glance at Raskolnikov. There was a scandal the other day in a restaurant, too. An author had eaten his dinner and would not pay. I'll write a satire on you, says he. And there was another of them on a steamer last week used the most disgraceful language to the respectable family of a civil counselor, his wife and daughter. And there was one of them turned out of a confectioner's shop the other day. They're like that. Authors, literary man, students, town criers. Foo, you get along. I shall look in upon you myself one day. Then you had better be careful. Do you hear? With hurried deference, Luce Ivanovna fell to curtsying in all directions, and so curtsied herself to the door. But at the door, she stumbled backwards against a good-looking officer with a fresh, open face and splendid thick fair whiskers. This was the superintendent of the district himself, Nikodim Farmich. Luce Ivanovna made haste to curtsy almost to the ground, and with mincing little steps, she fluttered out of the office. Again thunder and lightning a hurricane, said Nikodim Fomich to Ilya Petrovich in a civil and friendly tone. You are roused again. You are fuming again. I heard it on the stairs. Well, what then? Ilya Petrovich drawled with gentlemanly nonchalance, and he walked with some papers to another table, with a jaunty swing of his shoulders at each step. Here, if you will kindly look, an author or a student, has been one at least, does not pay his debts, has given an IOU, won't clear out of his room, and complaints are constantly being lodged against him, and here he has been pleased to make a protest against my smoking in his presence. He behaves like a cat himself, and just look at him, please. He is the gentleman, and very attractive he is. Poverty is not a vice, my friend, but we know you go off like powder. You can't bear a slight. I dare say you took offense at something and went too far yourself, continued Nikodim Farmich, turning affably to Raskolnikov. But you were wrong there. He is a capital fellow, I assure you, but explosive, explosive. He gets hot, fires up, boils over, and no stopping him. And then it's all over. And at the bottom, he's a heart of gold. His nickname in the regiment was the Explosive Lieutenant. And what a regiment it was, too, cried Ilya Petrovich, much gratified at this agreeable banter, though still sulky. Raskolnikov had a sudden desire to say something exceptionally pleasant to them all. Excuse me, Captain, he began easily, suddenly addressing Nikodim Fomich, will you enter into my position? I am ready to ask pardon, if I have been ill-mannered. I am a poor student, sick and shattered, shattered was the word he used, by poverty. I am not studying, because I cannot keep myself now, but I shall get money. I have a mother and sister in the province of Axe. They will send it to me, and I will pay. My landlady is a good-hearted woman, but she is so exasperated at my having lost my lessons and not paying her for the last for months, that she does not even send up my dinner and I don't understand this IOU at all. She is asking me to pay her on this IOU. How am I to pay her? Judge for yourselves. But that is not our business, you know, the head clerk was observing. Yes, yes, I perfectly agree with you. But allow me to explain Raskolnikov put in again, still addressing Nikodim Farmich, but trying his best to address Ilya Patrovich also, though the latter persistently appeared to be rummaging among his papers and to be contemptuously oblivious of him. Allow me to explain that I have been living with her for nearly three years and at first at first for why should I not confess it. At the very beginning I promised to marry her daughter. It was a verbal promise, freely given she was a girl indeed. I liked her, 
though I was not in love with her youthful affair in fact that is, I mean to say, that my landlady gave me credit freely in those days, and I led a life of I was very heedless nobody asks you for these personal details. Sir, we've no time to waste. Ilya Petrovich interposed roughly and with a note of triumph, but Raskolnikov stopped him hotly, though he suddenly found it exceedingly difficult to speak. Now, would he have asked his way if he had been going with such an object? As for Korch, he spent half an hour at the silversmith's below, before he went up to the old woman and he left him at exactly a quarter to eight. Now just consider but excuse me, how do you explain this contradiction? They state themselves that they knocked and the door was locked, yet three minutes later when they went up with the porter, it turned out the door was unfastened. That's just it, the murderer must have been there and bolted himself in, and they'd have caught him for a certainty if Korch had not been an ass and gone to look for the porter too. He must have seized the interval to get downstairs and slip by them somehow. Korch keeps crossing himself and saying, if I'd been there, he would have jumped out and killed me with his axe. He is going to have a thanksgiving service, ha, huh? ha. Huh. And no one saw the murderer. They might well not see him. The house is a regular Noah's Ark, said the head clerk, who was listening. It's clear, quite clear, Nikodim Farmage repeated warmly. No, it is anything but clear, Ilya Patrovich maintained. Raskolnikov picked up his hat and walked towards the door, but he did not reach it. When he recovered consciousness, he found himself sitting in a chair supported by someone on the right side, while someone else was standing on the left, holding a yellowish glass filled with yellow water, and Nikodim Fomich standing before him, looking intently at him. He got up from the chair. What's this? Are you ill? Nikodim Fomich asked, rather sharply. He could hardly hold his pen when he was signing, said the head clerk, settling back in his place and taking up his work again. Have you been ill long? cried Ilya Petrovich from his place, where he, too, was looking through papers. He had, of course, come to look at the sick man when he fainted, but retired at once when he recovered. Since yesterday, muttered Raskolnikov in reply, did you go out yesterday? Yes. Though you were ill? Yes. At what time? About seven. And where did you go, may I ask? Along the street, short and clear. Raskolnikov, white as a handkerchief, had answered sharply, jerkily, without dropping his black feverish eyes before Ilya Petrovich's stare. He can scarcely stand upright. And you niked him, Farmage was beginning. No matter, Ilya Petrovich pronounced rather peculiarly. Niked him, Farmage would have made some further protest, but glancing at the head clerk who was looking very hard at him, he did not speak. There was a sudden silence. It was strange. Very well, then, concluded Ilya Petrovich, we will not detain you. Raskolnikov went out. He caught the sound of eager conversation on his departure, and above the rest rose the questioning voice of Nikodim Farmich. In the street, his faintness passed off completely. A searcher will be a search at once, he repeated to himself, hurrying home. The brutes, they suspect. His former terror mustered him completely again. Chapter 2 and what if there has been a search already? What if I find them in my room? But here was his room. Nothing and no one in it. No one had peeped in. Even Nostasia had not touched it. But heavens, how could he have left all those things in the hole? He rushed to the corner, slipped his hand under the paper, pulled the things out and lined his pockets with them. There were eight articles in all, two little boxes with earrings or something of the sort. He hardly looked to see. Then for small leather cases. There was a chain, too, merely wrapped in newspaper and something else in newspaper that looked like a decoration. He put them all in the different pockets of his overcoat and the remaining pocket of his trousers, trying to conceal them as much as possible. He took the purse, too. Then he went out of his room, leaving the door open. He walked quickly and resolutely, and though he felt shattered, he had his senses about him. He was afraid of pursuit. He was afraid that in another half hour, another quarter of an hour perhaps, instructions would be issued for his pursuit, and so at all costs, he must hide all traces before then. He must clear everything up while he still had some strength, some reasoning power left him. Where was he to go? That had long been settled, fling them into the canal, and all traces hidden in the water, the thing would be at an end. 
so he had decided in the night of his delirium when several times he had had the impulse to get up and go away, to make haste, and get rid of it all. But to get rid of it turned out to be a very difficult task. He wandered along the bank of the Akaterininsky Canal for half an hour or more and looked several times at the steps running down to the water, but he could not think of carrying out his plan. Either rafts stood at the steps' edge, and women were washing clothes on them, or boats were moored there, and people were swarming everywhere. Moreover, he could be seen and noticed from the banks on all sides. It would look suspicious for a man to go down on purpose, stop, and throw something into the water. And what if the boxes were to float instead of sinking? And of course they would. Even as it was, everyone he met seemed to stare and look round, as if they had nothing to do but to watch him. Why is it, or can it be my fancy? He thought. At last the thought struck him that it might be better to go to the Neva. There were not so many people there. He would be less observed, and it would be more convenient in every way. Above all, it was further off. He wondered how he could have been wandering for a good half hour, worried and anxious in this dangerous past without thinking of it before. And that half hour he had lost over an irrational plan, simply because he had thought of it in delirium. He had become extremely absent and forgetful and he was aware of it. He certainly must make haste. He walked towards the Neva Long V prospect, but on the way another idea struck him. Why to the Neva? Would it not be better to go somewhere far off, to the islands again, and there hide the things in some solitary place, in a wood or under a bush, and mark the spot perhaps? And though he felt incapable of clear judgment, the idea seemed to him a sound one. But he was not destined to go there, for coming out of V Prospect towards the square, he saw on the left a passage leading between two blank walls to a courtyard. On the right hand, the blank and whitewashed wall of a four-storied house stretched far into the court. On the left, a wooden hoarding ran parallel with it for twenty paces into the court, and then turned sharply to the left. Here was a deserted, fenced-off place where rubbish of different sorts was lying. At the end of the court, the corner of a low, smutty, stone shed, apparently part of some workshop, peeped from behind the hoarding. It was probably a carriage builder's or carpenter's shed. The whole place from the entrance was black with coal dust. Here would be the place to throw it, he thought. Not seeing anyone in the yard, he slipped in, and at once saw near the gate a sink, such as is often put in yards where there are many workmen or cab drivers, and on the hoarding above had been scribbled in chalk the time-honored witticism, standing here strictly forbidden. This was all the better for there would be nothing suspicious about his going in. Here I could throw it all in a heap and get away. Looking round once more, with his hand already in his pocket, he noticed against the outer wall, between the entrance and the sink, a big and hewn stone, weighing perhaps sixty pounds. The other side of the wall was a street. He could hear passers-by, always numerous in that part, but he could not be seen from the entrance unless someone came in from the street which might well happen indeed, so there was need of haste. He bent down over the stone, seized the top of it firmly in both hands, and using all his strength turned it over. Under the stone was a small hollow in the ground, and he immediately emptied his pocket into it. The purse lay at the top, and yet the hollow was not filled up. Then he seized the stone again and with one twist turned it back, so that it was in the same position again, though it stood a very little higher. But he scraped the earth about it and pressed it at the edges with his foot. Nothing could be noticed. Then he went out and turned into the square. Again an intense, almost unbearable joy overwhelmed him for an instant, as it had in the police office. I have buried my tracks. And who, who can think of looking under that stone? It has been lying there most likely ever since the house was built, and will lie as many years more. And if it were found, who would think of me? It is all over. No clue. And he laughed. Yes, he remembered that he began laughing a thin, nervous, noiseless laugh, and went on laughing all the time he was crossing the square. But when he reached the Quai Boulevard where two days before he had come upon that girl, his laughter suddenly ceased. Other ideas crept into his mind. He felt all at once that it would be loathsome to pass that seat on which after the girl was gone, he had sat and pondered and that it would be hateful, too, to meet that whiskered policeman to whom he had given the twenty kopecks, damn him. He walked, looking about him angrily and distractedly. 
All his ideas now seemed to be circling round some single point, and he felt that there really was such a point, and that now, now, he was left facing that point and for the first time, indeed, during the last two months. Damn it all, he thought suddenly, in a fit of ungovernable fury. If it has begun, then it has begun. Hang the new life. Good lord, how stupid it is, and what lies I told today. How despicably I fond upon that wretched Ilya Petrovich. But that is all folly. What do I care for them all, and my fawning upon them? It is not that at all. It is not that at all. Suddenly he stopped. A new utterly unexpected and exceedingly simple question perplexed and bitterly confounded him. If it all has really been done deliberately and not idiotically. If I really had a certain and definite object. How is it I did not even glance into the purse and don't know what I had there, for which I have undergone these agonies, and have deliberately undertaken this base, filthy degrading business, and here I wanted at once to throw into the water the purse together with all the things which I had not seen either how's that. Yes, that was so, that was all so, yet he had known it all before, and it was not a new question for him, even when it was decided in the night without hesitation and consideration as though so it must be, as though it could not possibly be otherwise. Yes, he had known it all, and understood it all. It surely had all been settled even yesterday at the moment when he was banding over the box and pulling the jewel cases out of it. Yes, so it was. It is because I am very ill, he decided grimly at last. I have been worrying and fretting myself, and I don't know what I am doing. Yesterday and the day before yesterday and all this time I have been worrying myself. I shall get well and I shall not worry. But what if I don't get well at all? Good God, how sick I am of it all. He walked on without resting. He had a terrible longing for some distraction, but he did not know what to do, what to attempt. A new overwhelming sensation was gaining more and more mastery over him every moment. This was an immeasurable almost physical, repulsion for everything surrounding him, an obstinate, malignant feeling of hatred. All who met him were loathsome to him he loathed their faces, their movements, their gestures. If anyone had addressed him, he felt that he might have spat at him or bitten him. He stopped suddenly, on coming out on the bank of the little Neva, near the bridge to Vasilyevsky Ostrov. Why, he lives here, in that house, he thought. Why, I have not come to resume a hen of my own accord. Here it's the same thing over again. Very interesting to know, though, have I come on purpose or have I simply walked here by chance? Never mind, I said the day before yesterday that I would go and see him the day after. Well, and so I will. Besides, I really cannot go further now. He went up to Razumahin's room on the fifth floor. The latter was at home in his garret, busily writing at the moment, and he opened the door himself. It was for months since they had seen each other. Razumahin was sitting in a ragged dressing gown, with slippers on his bare feet, unkempt, unshaven, and unwashed. His face showed surprise. Is it you? He cried. He looked his comrade up and down. Then after a brief pause, he whistled. As hard up as all that. Why, brother, you've cut me out. He added, looking at Raskolnikov's rags. Come sit down, you are tired, I'll be bound. And when he had sunk down on the American lather sofa, which was in even worse condition than his own, Razumahin saw at once that his visitor was ill. Why, you are seriously ill, do you know that? He began feeling his pulse. Raskolnikov pulled away his hand. Never mind, he said, I've come for this, I have no lessons. I wanted, but I don't really want lessons. But I say, you are delirious, you know. Razumahin observed, watching him carefully. No, I am not. Raskolnikov got up from the sofa. As he had mounted the stairs to Razumahin's, he had not realized that he would be meeting his friend face to face. Now, in a flash, he knew that what he was least of all disposed for at that moment was to be face to face with anyone in the wide world. His spleen rose within him. He almost choked with rage at himself as soon as he crossed Razumahin's threshold. Goodbye, he said abruptly, and walked to the door. Stop, stop, you queer fish. I don't want to, said the other, again pulling away his hand. Then why the devil have you come? Are you mad, or what? Why, this is almost insulting. I won't let you go like that. 
Well, then, I came to you because I know no one but you who could help to begin because you are kinder than anyone cleverer, I mean, and can judge and now I see that I want nothing. Do you hear? Nothing at all, no one's services, no one's sympathy. I am by myself alone. Calm, that's enough. Leave me alone. Stay a minute, you sweep. You are a perfect madman, as you like for all I care. I have no lessons, do you see? And I don't care about that. But there's a bookseller, Hruvamo Venti takes the place of a lesson. I would not exchange him for five lessons. He's doing publishing of a kind, and issuing natural science manuals and what a circulation they have. The very titles are worth the money. You always maintained that I was a fool, but by Jove, my boy, there are greater fools than I am. Now he is setting up for being advanced. Not that he has an inkling of anything, but, of course, I encourage him. Here are two signatures of the German text in my opinion. The crudest charlatanism, it discusses the question, is woman a human being? And, of course, triumphantly proves that she is. Hoovermov is going to bring out this work as a contribution to the woman question. I'm translating it. He will expend these two and a half signatures into six. We shall make up a gorgeous title half a page long and bring it out at half a ruble. It will do. He pays me six rubles the signature. It works out to about fifteen rubles for the job, and I've had six already in advance. When we have finished this, we are going to begin a translation about whales, and then some of the dullest scandals out of the second part of Las Confessions we have marked for translation. Somebody has told Hruvamov that Russo was a kind of Redishev. You may be sure I don't contradict him. Hang him. Well, would you like to do the second signature of Eyes Woman a Human Being? If you would, take the German and pens and pepper all those are provided, and take three rubles, for as I have had six rubles in advance on the whole thing, three rubles come to you for your share, and when you have finished the signature there will be another three rubles for you. And please don't think I am doing you a service, quite the contrary, as soon as you came in, I saw how you could help me, to begin with. I am weak in spelling, and secondly, I am sometimes utterly adrift in German, so that I make it up as I go along for the most part. The only comfort is that it's bound to be a change for the better. Though who can tell, maybe it's sometimes for the worse. Will you take it? Raskolnikov took the German sheets in silence, took the three rubles and without a word went out. Razumahin gazed after him in astonishment, but when Raskolnikov was in the next street, he turned back mounted the stairs to resume hints again and laying on the table the German article and the three rubles went out again, still without uttering a word. Are you raving, or what? Razumahin shouted, roused to fury at last. What farce is this? You'll drive me crazy to what did you come to see me for, damn you. I don't want translation, muttered Raskolnikov from the stairs. Then what the devil do you want? shouted Razumahin from above. Raskolnikov continued descending the staircase in silence. Hey, there, where are you living? No answer. Well, confound you then. But Raskolnikov was already stepping into the street. On the Nikolevsky Bridge he was roused to full consciousness again by an unpleasant incident. A coachman, after shouting at him two or three times, gave him a violent lash on the back with his whip for having almost fallen under his horse's hoofs. The lash so infuriated him that he dashed away to the railing. For some unknown reason he had been walking in the very middle of the bridge in the traffic. He angrily clenched and ground his teeth. He heard laughter, of course. Serves him right. A pickpocket, I dare say. Pretending to be drunk, for sure, and getting under the wheels on purpose, and you have to answer for him. It's a regular profession, that's what it is. But while he stood at the railing, still looking angry and bewildered after the retreating carriage and rubbing his back, he suddenly felt someone thrust money into his hand. He looked. It was an elderly woman in a kerchief and goatskin shoes, with the girl, probably her daughter wearing a hat and carrying a green parasol. Take it, my good man, in Christ's name. He took it and they passed on. It was a piece of twenty kopecks. From his dress and appearance they might well have taken him for a beggar asking alms in the streets, and the gift of the twenty kopecks he doubtless owed to the blow, which made them feel sorry for him. He closed his hand on the twenty kopecks, walked on for ten paces, 
and turned facing the neighbor, looking towards the palace. The sky was without a cloud and the water was almost bright blue, which is so rare in the Neva. The cupola of the cathedral, which is seen at its best from the bridge about twenty paces from the chapel, glittered in the sunlight, and in the pure air every ornament on it could be clearly distinguished. The pain from the lash went off, and Raskolnikov forgot about it. One uneasy and not quite definite idea occupied him now completely. He stood still and gazed long and intently into the distance. This spot was especially familiar to him. When he was attending the university, he had hundreds of times generally on his way home stood still in this spot, gazed at this truly magnificent spectacle and almost always marveled at a vague and mysterious emotion it roused in him. It left him strangely cold. This gorgeous picture was for him blank and lifeless. He wondered every time at his somber and enigmatic impression and, mistrusting himself, put off finding the explanation of it. He vividly recalled those old doubts and perplexities, and it seemed to him that it was no mere chance that he recalled them now. It struck him as strange and grotesque that he should have stopped at the same spot as before, as though he actually imagined he could think the same thoughts, be interested in the same theories and pictures that had interested him so short a time ago. He felt it almost amusing, and yet it wrung his heart. Deep down, hidden far away out of sight all that seemed to him now all his old past, his old thoughts, his old problems and theories, his old impressions and that picture and himself and all, all. He felt as though he were flying upwards and everything were vanishing from his sight. Making an unconscious movement with his hand, he suddenly became aware of the piece of money in his fist. He opened his hand, stared at the coin, and with a sweep of his arm flung it into the water. Then he turned and went home. It seemed to him he had cut himself off from everyone and from everything at that moment. Evening was coming on when he reached home, so that he must have been walking about six hours. How and where he came back he did not remember, and dressing, and quivering like an overdriven horse, he lay down on the sofa, drew his great coat over him, and at once sank into oblivion. It was dusk when he was waked up by a fearful scream. Good God, what a scream! Such unnatural sounds, such howling, wailing, grinding, tears, blows and curses he had never heard. He could never have imagined such brutality, such frenzy. In terror he sat up in bed, almost swooning with agony. But the fighting, wailing and cursing grew louder and louder. And then to his intense amazement he caught the voice of his landlady. She was howling, shrieking and wailing, rapidly, hurriedly, incoherently, so that he could not make out what she was talking about. She was beseeching, no doubt, not to be beaten, for she was being mercilessly beaten on the stairs. The voice of her assailant was so horrible from spite and rage that it was almost a croak, but he, too, was saying something, and just as quickly and indistinctly, hurrying and spluttering. All at once Raskolnikov trembled. He recognized the voice seat was the voice of Ilya Petrovich. Ilya Petrovich here and beating the landlady. He is kicking her, banging her head against the steps that's clear, that can be told from the sounds, from the cries and the thuds. How is it? Is the world topsy-turvy? He could hear people running in crowds from all the stories and all the staircases. He heard voices, exclamations, knocking, doors banging. But why, why, and how could it be? He repeated, thinking seriously that he had gone mad. But no, he heard too distinctly. And they would come to him the next, for no doubt it's all about that about yesterday. Good God! He would have fastened his door with the latch but he could not lift his hand besides, it would be useless. Terror gripped his heart like ice, tortured him and numbed him. But at last all this uproar, after continuing about ten minutes, began gradually to subside. The landlady was moaning and groaning, Ilya Petrovich was still uttering threats and curses. But at last he, too, seemed to be silent, and now he could not be heard. Can he have gone away? Good Lord! Yes, and now the landlady is going too, still weeping and moaning and then her door slammed. Now the crowd was going from the stairs to their rooms, exclaiming, disputing, calling to one another, raising their voices to a shout, dropping them to a whisper. There must have been numbers of them almost all the inmates of the block. But, good God, how could it be? And why, why had he come here? 
Raskolnikov sank worn out on the sofa, but could not close his eyes. He lay for half an hour in such anguish, such an intolerable sensation of infinite terror as he had never experienced before. Suddenly a bright light flashed into his room. Nastasya came in with a candle and a plate of soup. Looking at him carefully and ascertaining that he was not asleep, she set the candle on the table and began to lay out what she had brought bread, salt, a plate, a spoon. You've eaten nothing since yesterday, I warrant. You've been trudging about all day, and you're shaking with fever. Nastasya, what were they beating the landlady for? She looked intently at him. Who beat the landlady? Just now, half an hour ago, Ilya Petrovich, the assistant superintendent, on the stairs. Why was he ill-treating her like that, and why was he here? Nastasya scrutinized him, silent and frowning, and her scrutiny lasted a long time. He felt uneasy, even frightened at her searching eyes. Nastasya, why don't you speak? He said timidly at last in a weak voice. It's the blood, she answered at last softly, as though speaking to herself. Blood? What blood? He muttered, growing white and turning towards the wall. Nastasya still looked at him without speaking. Nobody has been beating the landlady, she declared at last in a firm, resolute voice. He gazed at her, hardly able to breathe. I heard it myself. I was not asleep, I was sitting up, he said still more timidly. I listened a long while. The assistant superintendent came. Everyone ran out onto the stairs from all the flats. No one has been here. That's the blood crying in your ears. When there's no outlet for it and it gets clotted, you begin fancying things. Will you eat something? He made no answer. Nastasya still stood over him, watching him. Give me something to drink, Nastasya. She went downstairs and returned with a white earthenware jug of water. He remembered only swallowing one sip of the cold water and spilling some on his neck. Then followed forgetfulness. Chapter 3 he was not completely unconscious, however. All the time he was ill, he was in a feverish state, sometimes delirious, sometimes half-conscious. He remembered a great deal afterwards. Sometimes it seemed as though there were a number of people round him. They wanted to take him away somewhere. There was a great deal of squabbling and discussing about him. Then he would be alone in the room. They had all gone away afraid of him, and only now and then opened the door a crack to look at him. They threatened him plotted something together, laughed, and mocked at him. He remembered Nastasya often at his bad side. He distinguished another person, too, whom he seemed to know very well, though he could not remember who he was, and this fretted him, even made him cry. Sometimes he fancied he had been lying there a month, at other times it all seemed part of the same day. But of that off that he had no recollection, and yet every minute he felt that he had forgotten something he ought to remember. He worried and tormented himself trying to remember, moaned, flew into a rage, or sank into awful, intolerable terror. Then he struggled to get up, would have run away, but someone always prevented him by force, and he sank back into impotence and forgetfulness. At last he returned to complete consciousness. It happened at ten o'clock in the morning. On fine days the sun shone into the room at that hour, throwing a streak of light on the right wall and the corner near the door. Nastasya was standing beside him with another person, a complete stranger, who was looking at him very inquisitively. He was a young man with a beard, wearing a full, short-waisted coat, and looked like a messenger. The landlady was peeping in at the half-open door. Raskolnikov set up. Who is this, Nastasya? He asked, pointing to the young man. I say, he's himself again, she said. He is himself, echoed the man, concluding that he had returned to his senses. The landlady closed the door and disappeared. She was always shy and dreaded conversations or discussions. She was a woman of forty, not at all bad-looking, fat and buxom, with black eyes and eyebrows, good-natured from fatness and laziness, and absurdly bashful. Who are you? He went on, addressing the man. But at that moment the door was flung open, and, stooping a little, as he was so tall, Razumahin came in. What a cabinet is! He cried, I am always knocking my head. You call this a lodging, so you are conscious, brother. I've just heard the news from Pashanka. He has just come to, said Nastasya. Just come to, echoed the man again, with a smile. And who are you? Razumahin asked, suddenly addressing him. My name is Razumahin, at your service, not Razumahin, as I am always called, 
but Verzumahin, a student and gentleman, and he is my friend. And who are you? I am the messenger from our office, from the merchant Shelapiv, and I've come on business. Please sit down. Razumahin seated himself on the other side of the table. It's a good thing you've come to, brother, he went on to Raskolnikov. For the last four days you have scarcely eaten or drunk anything. We had to give you tea in spoonfuls. I brought Zosimov to see you twice. You remember Zosimov. He examined you carefully and said at once it was nothing serious something seemed to have gone to your head. Some nervous nonsense, the result of bad feeding. He says you have not had enough beer and reddish, but it's nothing much. It will pass and you will be all right. Zosimov is a first-rate fellow. He is making quite a name. Come, I won't keep you, he said, addressing the man again. Will you explain what you want? You must know, Rodya, this is the second time they have sent from the office, but it was another man last time, and I talked to him. Who was it came before? That was the day before yesterday. I venture to say, if you please, sir. That was Alexei Semyonovich. He is in our office, too. He was more intelligent than you, don't you think so? Yes, indeed, sir. He is of more weight than I am. Quite so, go on. At your mama's request, through Afanasy Ivanovich Vrushin, of whom I presume you have heard more than once, a remittance is sent to you from our office, the man began, addressing Raskolnikov. If you are in an intelligible condition, I've thirty-five rubles to remit to you, as Semyon Semyonovich has received from Afanasy Ivanovich at your mama's request instructions to that effect, as on previous occasions. Do you know him, sir? Yes, I remember Verushin, Raskolnikov said dreamily. You hear, he knows Verushin, cried Razumahin. He is in an intelligible condition, and I see you are an intelligent man too. Well, it's always pleasant to hear words of wisdom. That's the gentleman, Verushin, Afanasy Ivanovich. And at the request of your mama, who has sent you a remittance once before in the same manner through him, he did not refuse this time also, and sent instructions to Semyon Semyonovich some days since to hand you thirty-five rubles in the hope of better to come. That hoping for better to come is the best thing you've said, though I am mama is not bad either. Come then, what do you say? Is he fully conscious, eh? That's all right. If only he can sign this little paper. He can scrawl his name. Have you got the book? Yes, here's the book. Give it to me. Here, Rodya, sit up. I'll hold you. Take the pen and scribble Raskolnikov for him. For just now, brother, money is sweeter to us than treacle. I don't want it, said Raskolnikov, pushing away the pen. Not want it. I won't sign it. How the devil can you do without signing it? I don't want the money. Don't want the money. Come, brother, that's nonsense. I bear witness. Don't trouble, please, it's only that he is on his travels again. But that's pretty common with him at all times though. You are a man of judgment and we will take him in hand. That is, more simply, take his hand and he will sign it. Here. But I can come another time. No, no. Why should we trouble you? You are a man of judgment. Now, Rodier, don't keep your visitor. You see he is waiting. And he made ready to hold Raskolnikov's hand in earnest. Stop. I'll do it alone, said the latter, taking the pen and signing his name. The messenger took out the money and went away. Bravo. And now, brother, are you hungry? Yes, answered Raskolnikov. Is there any soup? Some of yesterday's, answered Nastasya, who was still standing there, with potatoes and rice in it. Yes, I know it by heart. Bring soup and give us some tea. Very well. Raskolnikov looked at all this with profound astonishment and a dull, unreasoning terror. He made up his mind to keep quiet and see what would happen. I believe I am not wandering. I believe it's reality, he thought. In a couple of minutes Nastasya returned with the soup and announced that the tea would be ready directly. With the soup she brought to spoons, two plates, salt, pepper, mustard for the beef, and so on. The table was set as it had not been for a long time. The cloth was clean. It would not be amiss, Nastasya, if Praskovia Pavlovna were to send us up a couple of bottles of beer. We could empty them. Well, you are a cool hand, muttered Nastasya, and she departed to carry out his orders.
Raskolnikov still gazed wildly with strained attention. Meanwhile, Razumahin sat down on the sofa beside him as clumsily as a bear put his left arm round Raskolnikov's head. Although he was able to sit up and with his right hand gave him a spoonful of soup, blowing on it that it might not burn him. But the soup was only just warm. Raskolnikov swallowed one spoonful greedily, then a second, then a third. But after giving him a few more spoonfuls of soup, Razumahin suddenly stopped and said that he must ask Sosimov whether he ought to have more. Nastasia came in with two bottles of beer. And will you have tea? Yes. Cut along, Nastasia, and bring some tea, for tea we may venture on without the faculty. But here is the beer. He moved back to his chair, pulled the soup and meat in front of him, and began eating as though he had not touched food for three days. I must tell you, Rodya, I dine like this here every day now, he mumbled with his mouth full of beef, and it's all Pashenka, your dear little landlady, who sees to that, she loves to do anything for me. I don't ask for it, but, of course, I don't object. And here's Nastasia with the tea. She is a quick girl. Nastasia, my dear, won't you have some beer? Get along with your nonsense. A cup of tea, then. A cup of tea, maybe. Pour it out. Stay, I'll pour it out myself. Sit down. He poured out two cups, left his dinner, and sat on the sofa again. As before, he put his left arm round the sick man's head, raised him up and gave him tea in spoonfuls, again blowing each spoonful steadily and earnestly, as though this process was the principal and most effective means towards his friend's recovery. Raskolnikov said nothing and made no resistance, though he felt quite strong enough to sit up on the sofa without support and could not merely have held a cup or a spoon, but even perhaps could have walked about. But from some queer, almost animal, cunning he conceived the idea of hiding his strength and lying low for a time, pretending if necessary not to be yet in full possession of his faculties, and meanwhile listening to find out what was going on. Yet he could not overcome his sense of repugnance. After sipping a dozen spoonfuls of tea, he suddenly released his head, pushed the spoon away capriciously, and sank back on the pillow. There were actually real pillows under his head now, down pillows in clean cases. He observed that, too, and took note of it. Koshenka must give us some raspberry gem today to make him some raspberry tea, said Razumahin, going back to his chair and attacking his soup and beer again. And where is she to get raspberries for you? Asked Nastasia, balancing a saucer on her five outspread fingers and sipping tea through a lump of sugar. She'll get it at the shop, my dear. You see, Rodia, all sorts of things have been happening while you have been laid up. When you decamped in that rascally way without leaving your address, I felt so angry that I resolved to find you out and punish you. I set to work that very day. How I ran about making inquiries for you. This lodging of yours I had forgotten, though I never remembered it, indeed, because I did not know it, and as for your old lodgings, I could only remember it was at the Five Corners, Harlamov's house. I kept trying to find that Harlamov's house, and afterwards it turned out that it was not Harlamov's, but Butch's. How one muddles up sound sometimes. So I lost my temper, and I went on the chance to the address bureau next day, and only fancy, into minutes they looked you up. Your name is down there. My name? I should think so, and yet a General Kobolev they could not find while I was there. Well, it's a long story. But as soon as I did land on this place, I soon got to know all your affairs all. All, brother, I know everything. Nastasia here will tell you. I made the acquaintance of Nikodim Fomich and Ilya Petrovich, and the house porter and Mr. Zemetov, Alexander Grigorievich, the head clerk in the police office, and, last, but not least, of Pashenka, Nastasia here knows. He's got round her, Nastasia murmured, smiling slyly. Why don't you put the sugar in your tea, Nastasia Nikiforovna? You are a one, Nastasia cried suddenly, going off into a giggle. I am not Nikiforovna, but Petrovna, she added suddenly, recovering from her mirth. I'll make a note of it, I'll make a note of it. Well, brother, to make a long story short, I was going in for a regular explosion here to uproot all malignant influences in the locality, but Pashenka won the day. I had not expected, brother, to find her so prepossessing. Eh? What do you think? Raskolnikov did not speak, but he still kept his eyes fixed upon him, full of alarm. 
and all that could be wished. Indeed, in every respect, Razumahin went on, not at all embarrassed by his silence. Ah, the sly dog, Nastasia shrieked again. This conversation afforded her unspeakable delight. It's a pity, brother, that you did not set to work in the right way at first. You ought to have approached her differently. She is, so to speak, a most unaccountable character. But we will talk about her character later. How could you let things come to such a pass that she gave up sending you your dinner? And that I owe you. You must have been mad to sign an I owe you. And that promise of marriage when her daughter, Natalia Yegorovna, was alive. I know all about it. But I see that's a delicate matter and I am an ass. Forgive me. But, talking of foolishness, do you know Praskovia Pavlovna is not nearly so foolish as you would think at first sight? No, mumbled Raskolnikov, looking away, but feeling that it was better to keep up the conversation. She isn't, is she? cried Razumahin, delighted to get an answer out of him. But she is not very clever either, eh? She is essentially, essentially an unaccountable character. I am sometimes quite at a loss, I assure you. She must be forty, she says she is thirty-six, and of course she has every right to say so. But I swear I judge her intellectually, simply from the metaphysical point of view. There is a sort of symbolism sprung up between us, a sort of algebra or what not. I don't understand it. Well, that's all nonsense. Only, seeing that you are not a student now and have lost your lessons and your clothes, and that through the young lady's death she has no need to treat you as a relation. She suddenly took fright, and as you hid in your den and dropped all your old relations with her, she planned to get rid of you, and she's been cherishing that design a long time, but was sorry to lose the IOU, for you assured her yourself that your mother would pay. It was base of me to say that. My mother herself is almost a beggar, and I told a lie to keep my lodging and be fed, Raskolnikov said loudly and distinctly. Yes, you did very sensibly. But the worst of it is that at that point Mr. Shabrov turns up, a businessman. Koshenka would never have thought of doing anything on her own account. She is to retiring, but the businessman is by no means retiring. And first thing he puts the question, is there any hope of realizing the IOU? Answer, there is, because he has a mother who would save her Rodya with her 125 rubles pension if she is to starve herself and a sister, too, who would go into bondage for his sake. That's what he was building upon. Why do you start? I know all the ins and outs of your affairs now. My dear boy, it's not for nothing that you were so open with Pashenka when you were her prospective son-in-law. And I say all this as a friend. But I tell you what it is, an honest and sensitive man is open, and a businessman listens and goes on eating you up. Well, then she gave the IOU by way of payment to this Chabrov and without hesitation he made a formal demand for payment. When I heard of all this I wanted to blow him up, too, to clear my conscience, but by that time harmony reigned between me and Pashenka, and I insisted on stopping the whole affair, engaging that you would pay. I went security for you, brother. Do you understand? We called Chabrov, flung him ten rubles and got the IOU back from him, and here I have the honor of presenting it to you. She trusts your word now. Here, take it, you see I have torn it. Razumahin put the note on the table. Raskolnikov looked at him and turned to the wall without uttering a word. Even Razumahin felt a twinge. I see, brother, he said a moment later, that I have been playing the fool again. I thought I should amuse you with my chatter, and I believe I have only made you cross. Was it you I did not recognize when I was delirious? Raskolnikov asked, after a moment's pause without turning his head. Yes, and you flew into a rage about it, especially when I brought Zamatov one day. Zamatov, the head clerk, what for? Raskolnikov turned round quickly and fixed his eyes on Razumahin. What's the matter with you? What are you upset about? He wanted to make your acquaintance because I talked to him a lot about you. How could I have found out so much except from him? He is a capital fellow, brother, first rate in his own way, of course. Now we are friends see each other almost every day. I have moved into this part, you know. I have only just moved. I've been with him to Luce Ivanovna once or twice. Do you remember Luce, Luce Ivanovna? Did I say anything in delirium? I should think so. You were beside yourself. What did I rave about? What next? What did you rave about? 
What people do rave about? Well, brother, now I must not lose time. To work, he got up from the table and took up his cap. What did I rave about? How he keeps on. Are you afraid of having let out some secret? Don't worry yourself, you said nothing about a countess. But you said a lot about a bulldog, and about earrings and chains, and about Krestovsky Island, and some porter, and Nikodem Farmich and Ilya Patrovich, the assistant superintendent. And another thing that was of special interest to you was your own sock. You whined, give me my sock. Zemetov hunted all about your room for your socks, and with his own scented, ring-bedecked fingers, he gave you the rag. And only then were you comforted, and for the next twenty-four hours you held the wretched thing in your hand. We could not get it from you. It is most likely somewhere under your quilt at this moment. And then you asked so piteously for fringe for your trousers. We tried to find out what sort of fringe, but we could not make it out. Now to business. Here are thirty-five rubles. I take ten of them, and shall give you an account of them in an hour or two. I will let Zosimov know at the same time, though he ought to have been here long ago, for it is nearly twelve. And you, Nastasya, looking pretty often while I am away, to see whether he wants a drink or anything else. And I will tell Pashanka what is wanted myself. Goodbye. He calls her Pashanka. Ah, he's a deep one, said Nastasya as he went out. Then she opened the door and stood listening, but could not resist running downstairs after him. She was very eager to hear what he would say to the landlady. She was evidently quite fascinated by Razumahin. No sooner had she left the room than the sick man flung off the bad clothes and leapt out of bed like a madman. With burning, twitching impatience he had waited for them to be gone so that he might set to work. But to what work? Now, as though to spite him, it eluded him. Good God, only tell me one thing, do they know of it yet or not? What if they know it and are only pretending, mocking me while I am laid up, and then they will come in and tell me that it's been discovered long ago and that they have only what am I to do now? That's what I've forgotten, as though on purpose, forgotten it all at once, I remembered a minute ago. He stood in the middle of the room and gazed in miserable bewilderment about him. He walked to the door, opened it, listened, but that was not what he wanted. Suddenly, as though recalling something, he rushed to the corner where there was a hole under the paper, began examining it, put his hand into the hole, fumbled but that was not it. He went to the stove, opened it and began rummaging in the ashes. The frayed edges of his trousers and the rags cut off his pocket were lying there just as he had thrown them. No one had looked then. Then he remembered the sock about which Razumin had just been telling him. Yes, there it lay on the sofa under the quilt, but it was so covered with dust and grime that Zamatov could not have seen anything on it. Bar, Zamatov, the police office. And why am I sent for to the police office? Where's the notice? Bar, I am mixing it up. That was then. I looked at my sock then, too, but now, now I have been ill. But what did Zamatov come for? Why did Razumahin bring him? He muttered, helplessly sitting on the sofa again. What does it mean? Am I still in delirium? Or is it real? I believe it is real. Ah, oh, I remember. I must escape. Make haste to escape. Yes, I must. I must escape. Yes, but where? And where are my clothes? I've no boots. They've taken them away. They've hidden them. I understand. Ah, oh, here is my coat. He passed that over. And here is money on the table. Thank God. And here's the IOU. I'll take the money and go and take another lodging. They won't find me. Yes, but the address bureau. They'll find me. Razumahin will find me. Better escape altogether far away to America and let them do their worst. And take the IOU. It would be of use there. What else shall I take? They think I am ill. They don't know that I can walk. Ha ha ha. I could see by their eyes that they know all about it. If only I could get downstairs. And what if they have set a watch there, policeman? What's this tea? Ah, and here is beer left. Half a bottle, cold. He snatched up the bottle, which still contained a glassful of beer, and gulped it down with relish, as though quenching a flame in his breast. But in another minute the beer had gone to his head, and a faint and even pleasant shiver ran down his spine. He lay down and pulled the quilt over him. His sick and incoherent thoughts grew more and more disconnected, and soon a light, pleasant drowsiness came upon him. With a sense of comfort he nestled his head into the pillow, wrapped more closely about him the soft, 
Wadded quilt which had replaced the old, ragged greatcoat sighed softly and sank into a deep, sound, refreshing sleep. He woke up, hearing someone come in. He opened his eyes and saw Razumahin standing in the doorway, uncertain whether to come in or not. Raskolnikov sat up quickly on the sofa and gazed at him, as though trying to recall something. Ah, oh, you are not asleep. Here I am, Nastasya, bring in the parcel. Razumahin shouted down the stairs. You shall have the account directly. What time is it? Asked Raskolnikov, looking round uneasily. Yes, you had a fine sleep, brother. It's almost evening. It will be six o'clock directly. You have slept more than six hours. Good heavens. Have I? And why not? It will do you good. What's the hurry? A tryst, is it? We've all time before us. I've been waiting for the last three hours for you. I've been up twice and found you asleep. I've called on Zosimov twice, not at home, only fancy. But no matter, he will turn up. And I've been out on my own business, too. You know I've been moving today, moving with my uncle. I have an uncle living with me now, but that's no matter, to business. Give me the parcel, Nastasya. We will open it directly. And how do you feel now, brother? I am quite well. I am not ill. Razumahin, have you been here long? I tell you I've been waiting for the last three hours. No, before. How do you mean? How long have you been coming here? Why I told you all about it this morning. Don't you remember? Raskolnikov pondered. The morning seemed like a dream to him. He could not remember alone and looked inquiringly at Razumahin. Hm? Said the latter. He has forgotten. I fancied then that you were not quite yourself. Now you are better for your sleep. You really look much better. First rate. Well, to business. Look here, my dear boy. He began untying the bundle, which evidently interested him. Believe me, brother, this is something specially near my heart. For we must make a man of you. Let's begin from the top. Do you see this cap? He said, taking out of the bundle a fairly good though cheap and ordinary cap. Let me try it on. Presently, afterwards, said Raskolnikov, waving it off pattishly. Come, Rodya, my boy. Don't oppose it. Afterwards will be too late, and I shan't sleep all night, for I bought it by guess, without measure. Just right, he cried triumphantly, fitting it on, just your size. A proper head covering is the first thing in dress and a recommendation in its own way. Tolstukov, a friend of mine, is always obliged to take off his pudding basin when he goes into any public place where other people wear their hats or caps. People think he does it from slavish politeness, but it's simply because he is ashamed of his bird's nest. He is such a boastful fellow. Look, Nastasya, here are two specimens of headgear. This pomiston took from the corner Raskolnikov's old, battered hat, which for some unknown reason he called a pomistona this jewel. Guess the price, Rodya. What do you suppose I paid for it, Nastasya? He said, turning to her, seeing that Raskolnikov did not speak. Twenty kopecks, no more, I dare say, answered Nastasya. Twenty kopecks, silly, he cried, offended. Why, nowadays you would cost more than thirty kopecks, and that only because it has been worn, and it's bought on condition that when it's worn out, they will give you another next year. Yes, on my word. Well, now let us pass to the United States of America, as they called them at school. I assure you I am proud of these breeches, and he exhibited to Raskolnikov a pair of light, summer trousers of grey woolen material. No holes, no spots, and quite respectable, although a little worn, and a waistcoat to match, quite in the fashion. And it's being worn really is an improvement, it's softer, smoother. You see, Rodya, to my thinking, the great thing for getting on in the world is always to keep to the seasons. If you don't insist on having asparagus in January, you keep your money in your purse. And it's the same with this purchase. It's summer now, so I've been buying summer things. Warmer materials will be wanted for autumn, so you will have to throw these away in any case especially, as they will be done for by then from their own lack of coherence if not your highest standard of luxury. Come, price them. What do you say? To rubles 25 kopecks. And remember the condition, if you wear these out, you will have another suit for nothing. They only do business on that system at Fadiev's. If you've bought a thing once, you are satisfied for life, 
for you will never go there again of your own free will. Now for the boots. What do you say? You see that they are a bit worn, but they'll last a couple of months. For its foreign work and foreign leather, the secretary of the English embassy sold them last week had only worn them six days, but he was very short of cash. Pricey a ruble and a half. A bargain, but perhaps they won't fit, observed Nastasia. Not fit, just look. And he pulled out of his pocket Raskolnikov's old, broken boot, stiffly coated with dry mud. I did not go empty-handedly took the size from this monster. We all did our best. And as to your linen, your landlady has seen to that. Here, to begin with, are three shirts, hampen but with a fashionable front. Well now then, eighty kopecks the cap, two rubles twenty-five kopecks the suit together, three rubles five kopecks a ruble and a half for the boots for, you see, they are very good and that makes for rubles fifty-five kopecks. Five rubles for the underclothes tea were bought in the low which makes exactly nine rubles fifty-five kopecks. 45 kopecks change in coppers. Will you take it? And so, Rodya, you are set up with a complete new rig out, for your overcoat will serve, and even has a style of its own. That comes from getting one's clothes from Sharma's. As for your socks and other things, I leave them to you. We've 25 rubles left. And as for Pashenka and paying for your lodging, don't you worry. I tell you she'll trust you for anything. And now, Brother, let me change your linen, for I dare say you will throw off your illness with your shirt. Let me be, I don't want to. Raskolnikov waved him off. He had listened with disgust to Razumihin's efforts to be playful about his purchases. Come, brother, don't tell me I've been trudging around for nothing, Razumihin insisted. Nastasya, don't be bashful, but help methods it, and in spite of Raskolnikov's resistance he changed his linen. The latter sank back on the pillows and for a minute or two said nothing. It will be long before I get rid of them, he thought. What money was all that bought with? He asked at last, gazing at the wall. Money. Why, your own, what the messenger brought from Verushin. Your mother sent it. Have you forgotten that, too? I remember now, said Raskolnikov after a long, sullen silence. Razumahin looked at him, frowning and uneasy. The door opened and a tall, stout man, whose appearance seemed familiar to Raskolnikov, came in. Chapter 4 Zosimov was a tall, fat man with a puffy, colorless, clean-shaven face and straight flexen hair. He wore spectacles and a big gold ring on his fat finger. He was twenty-seven. He had on a light grey fashionable loose coat, light summer trousers, and everything about him loose, fashionable, and spick and span. His linen was irreproachable, his watch chain was massive. In manner he was slow and, as it were, nonchalant, and at the same time studiously free and easy, he made efforts to conceal his self-importance, but it was apparent at every instant. All his acquaintances found him tedious, but said he was clever at his work. I've been to you twice today, brother. You see, he's come to himself, cried Razumahin. I see, I see, and how do we feel now, ah? Uh, said Sosimov to Raskolnikov, watching him carefully and, sitting down at the foot of the sofa, he settled himself as comfortably as he could. He is still depressed, Razumahin went on. We've just changed his linen, and he almost cried. That's very natural. You might have put it off if he did not wish it. His pulse is first rate. Is your head still aching? Uh, I am well. I am perfectly well. Raskolnikov declared positively and irritably. He raised himself on the sofa and looked at them with glittering eyes, but sank back onto the pillow at once and turned to the wall. Zosimov watched him intently. Very good. Going on all right, he said lazily. Has he eaten anything? They told him and asked what he might have. He may have anything soup, tea mushrooms and cucumbers. Of course, you must not give him. He'd better not have meat either, and but no need to tell you that. Razumahin and he looked at each other. No more medicine or anything. I'll look at him again tomorrow. Perhaps, today even, but never mind tomorrow evening I shall take him for a walk, said Razumahin. We're going to the Yusupov garden and then to the Palady Crystal. I would not disturb him tomorrow at all, but I don't know a little. Maybe, but we'll see. Ach, what a nuisance. I've got a housewarming party tonight, it's only a step from here. Couldn't he come? He could lie on the sofa. You are coming, Razumahin said to Zosimov. 
Don't forget, you promised. All right, only rather later. What are you going to do? Oh, nothing, Tia. Vodka. Herrings. There will be a pie just our friends. And who? All neighbors here. Almost all new friends. Except my old uncle. And he is new too. Only arrived in Petersburg yesterday to see to some business of his. We meet once in five years. What is he? He's been stagnating all his life as a district postmaster. Gets a little pension. He is 65 and not worth talking about. But I am fond of him. Porfiry Petrovich, the head of the investigation department here but you know him. Is he a relation of yours too? A very distant one. But why are you scowling? Because you quarreled once, won't you come then? I don't care a damn for him. So much the better. Well, there will be some students, a teacher, a government clerk, a musician, an officer and Zemetov. Do tell me, please, what you or Hizosimov nodded at Raskolnikov can have in common with this Zemetov. Oh, you particular gentlemen. Principles. You were worked by principles, as it were by springs. You won't venture to turn round on your own account. If a man is a nice fellow, that's the only principle I go upon. Zemetov is a delightful person, though he does take bribes. Well, he does. And what of it? I don't care if he does take bribes, Razumahin cried with unnatural irritability. I don't praise him for taking bribes. I only say he is a nice man in his own way. But if one looks at man in all ways there are many good ones left. Why, I'm sure I shouldn't be worth a baked onion myself perhaps with you thrown in. That's too little, I'd give to for you. And I wouldn't give more than one for you. No more of your jokes. Zemetov is no more than a boy. I can pull his hair and one must draw him, not repel him. You'll never improve a man by repelling him, especially a boy. One has to be twice as careful with a boy. Oh, you progressive dullards. You don't understand. You harm yourselves running another man down. But if you want to know, we really have something in common. I should like to know what. Why, it's all about a house painter. We are getting him out of the mass. Though indeed there's nothing to fear now. The matter is absolutely self-evident. We only put on steam. A painter. Why, haven't I told you about it? I only told you the beginning then about the murder of the old pawnbroker woman. Well, the painter is mixed up in it. Oh, I heard about that murder before and was rather interested in it partly for one reason. I read about it in the papers, too. Lizaveta was murdered, too, Nastasia blurted out, suddenly addressing Raskolnikov. She remained in the room all the time, standing by the door listening. Lizaveta, murmured Raskolnikov hardly audibly. Lizaveta, who sold old clothes. Didn't you know her? She used to come here. She mandated a shirt for you, too. Raskolnikov turned to the wall where in the dirty, yellow paper he picked out one clumsy, white flower with brown lines on it and began examining how many petals there were in it, how many scallops in the petals and how many lines on them. He felt his arms and legs as lifeless as though they had been cut off. He did not attempt to move, but stared obstinately at the flower. But what about the painter? Zosimov interrupted Nastasya's chatter with marked displeasure. She sighed and was silent. Why? He was accused of the murder, Razumahin went on hotly. Was there evidence against him then? Evidence, indeed. Evidence that was no evidence, and that's what we have to prove. It was just as they pitched on those fellows, Korch and Pastryakov, at first. Foo! How stupidly it's all done, it makes one sick, though it's not one's business. Pastryakov may be coming tonight. By the way, Rodya, you've heard about the business already. It happened before you were ill, the day before you fainted at the police office while they were talking about it. Zosimov looked curiously at Raskolnikov. He did not stir. But I say, Razumahin, I wonder at you. What a busybody you are, Zosimov observed. Maybe I am, but we will get him off anyway, shouted Razumahin, bringing his fist down on the table. What's the most offensive is not that lying goni can always forgive lying lying is a delightful thing, for it leads to truth what is offensive is that they lie and worship their own lying. I respect Porfrey, but what threw them out at first? The door was locked, and when they came back with the porter it was open. So it followed that Koch and Pastryakov were the murderer shit was their logic. But don't excite yourself, they simply detained them, they could not help that. And, by the way, I've met that man Koch. 
He used to buy unredeemed pledges from the old woman, eh? Yes, he is a swindler. He buys up bad debts, too. He makes a profession of it. But enough of him. Do you know what makes me angry? It's their sickening, rotten, petrified routine. And this case might be the means of introducing a new method. One can show from the psychological data alone how to get on the track of the real man. We have facts, they say. But facts are not everything, at least half the business lies in how you interpret them. Can you interpret them, then? Anyway, one can't hold one's tongue when one has a feeling, a tangible feeling, that one might be a help if only. Eh? Do you know the details of the case? I am waiting to hear about the painter. Oh, yes. Well, here's the story. Early on the third day after the murder, when they were still dandling Koch and Pastryakov how they accounted for every step they took and it was as plain as a pike stuff an unexpected fact turned up. A peasant called Dushkin, who keeps a dream shop facing the house, brought to the police office a jeweler's case containing some gold earrings and told a long rigamarily. The day before yesterday, just after eight o'clock marked the day and the our journeyman house painter, Nikolai, who had been in to see me already that day, brought me this box of gold earrings and stones and asked me to give him two rubles for them. When I asked him where he got them, he said that he picked them up in the street. I did not ask him anything more. I am telling you Dushkin's story. I gave him a note a ruble that is for I thought if he did not pawn it with me he would with another. It would all come to the same thing had spent it on drink, so the thing had better be with me. The further you hide it the quicker you will find it, and if anything turns up, if I hear any rumors, I'll take it to the police. Of course, that's all terdiddle. He lies like a horse, for I know this Dushkin. He is a pawnbroker and a receiver of stolen goods, and he did not cheat Nikolai out of a thirty ruble trinket in order to give it to the police. He was simply afraid, but no matter, to return to Dushkin's story. I've known this peasant, Nikolai Dementiev, from a child. He comes from the same province and district of Tsarisk. We are both Ryazan man. And though Nikolai is not a drunkard, he drinks, and I knew he had a job in that house, painting work with Dmitri, who comes from the same village, too. As soon as he got the ruble he changed it, had a couple of glasses, took his change and went out. But I did not see Dmitri with him then. And the next day I heard that someone had murdered Ileona Ivanovna and her sister, Lizaveta Ivanovna, with an axe. I knew them and I felt suspicious about the earrings at once, for I knew the murdered woman lent money on pledges. I went to the house and began to make careful inquiries without saying a word to anyone. First of all I asked, is Nikolai here? Dmitri told me that Nikolai had gone off on the spree, he had come home at daybreak drunk, stayed in the house about ten minutes, and went out again. Dmitri didn't see him again and is finishing the job alone and their job is on the same staircase as the murder, on the second floor. When I heard all that I did not say a word to any one of its Dushkin's tale but I found out what I could about the murder, and went home feeling as suspicious as ever. And at eight o'clock this morning that was the third day, you understand he saw Nikolai coming in, not sober, though not to say very drunk could understand what was said to him. He sat down on the bench and did not speak. There was only one stranger in the bar and a man I knew asleep on a bench and our two boys. Have you seen Dmitri? said I. No, I haven't, said he. And you've not been here either? Not since the day before yesterday, said he. And where did you sleep last night? In Parsky, with the Kolomansky man. And where did you get those earrings? I asked. I found them in the street and the way he said it was a bit queer. He did not look at me. Did you hear what happened that very evening, at that very hour, on that same staircase? Said I. No, said he, I had not heard. And all the while he was listening, his eyes were staring out of his head and he turned as white as chalk. I told him all about it and he took his hat and began getting up. I wanted to keep him. Wait a bit, Nikolai, said I, won't you have a drink? And I signed to the boy to hold the door, and I came out from behind the bar but he darted out and down the street to the turning at a run. I have not seen him since. Then my doubts were at an end it was his doing, as clear as could be. I should think so, said Zosimov. Wait, hear the end. Of course they sought high and low for Nikolai, 
they detained Dushkin and searched his house. Dmitri, too, was arrested. The Kolomensky men also were turned inside out. And the day before yesterday they arrested Nikolai in a tavern at the end of the town. He had gone there, taken the silver cross off his neck and asked for a dram for it. They gave it to him. A few minutes afterwards the woman went to the couched, and through a crack in the wall she saw in the stable adjoining he had made a noose of his sash from the beam, stood on a block of wood, and was trying to put his neck in the noose. The woman screeched her hardest. People ran in, so that's what you are up to. Take me, he says, to such and such a police officer, I'll confess everything. Well, they took him to that police station that is here with a suitable escort. So they asked him this and that, how old he is, twenty-two, and so on. At the question, when you were working with Dmitri, didn't you see anyone on the staircase at such and such a time? Answer, to be sure folks may have gone up and down, but I did not notice them. And didn't you hear anything, any noise, and so on? We heard nothing special. And did you hear, Nikolai, that on the same day widow so-and-so and her sister were murdered and robbed? I never knew a thing about it. The first I heard of it was from Afanasy Pavlovich the day before yesterday. And where did you find the earrings? I found them on the pavement. Why didn't you go to work with Dmitri the other day? Because I was drinking. And where were you drinking? Oh, in such and such a place. Why did you run away from Dushkins? Because I was awfully frightened. What were you frightened of? That I should be accused. How could you be frightened if you felt free from guilt? Now, Zosimov, you may not believe me. That question was put literally in those words. I know it for a fact. It was repeated to me exactly. What do you say to that? Well, anyway, there's the evidence. I am not talking of the evidence now. I am talking about that question of their own idea of themselves. Well, so they squeezed and squeezed him and he confessed. I did not find it in the street, but in the flat where I was painting with Dmitri. And how was that? Way, Dmitri and I were painting there all day, and we were just getting ready to go, and Dmitri took a brush and painted my face, and he ran off and I after him. I ran after him, shouting my hardest, and at the bottom of the stairs I ran right against the porter and some gentlemen, and how many gentlemen were there I don't remember. And the porter swore at me, and the other porter swore, too, and the porter's wife came out and swore at us, too, and a gentleman came into the entry with a lady, and he swore at us, too, for Dmitri and I lay right across the way. I got hold of Dmitri's hair and knocked him down and began beating him, and Dmitri, too, caught me by the hair and began beating me, but we did it all not for temper but in a friendly way, for sport. And then Dmitri escaped and ran into the street, and I ran after him, but I did not catch him, and went back to the flat alone. I had to clear up my things. I began putting them together, expecting Dmitri to come, and there in the passage, in the corner by the door, I stepped on the box. I saw it lying there wrapped up in paper. I took off the paper, saw some little hooks, undid them, and in the box were the earrings. Behind the door, lying behind the door, behind the door, Raskolnikov cried suddenly, staring with a blank look of terror at Razumihin, and he slowly sat up on the sofa leaning on his hand. Yes, why? What's the matter? What's wrong? Razumahin, too, got up from his seat. Nothing, Raskolnikov answered faintly, turning to the wall. All were silent for a while. He must have waked from a dream, Razumahin said at last, looking inquiringly at Zosimov. The latter slightly shook his head. Well, go on, said Zosimov. What next? What next? As soon as he saw the earrings, forgetting Dmitri and everything, he took up his cap and ran to Dushkin and, as we know, got a ruble from him. He told a lie saying he found them in the street and went off drinking. He keeps repeating his old story about the murder. I know nothing of it, never heard of it till the day before yesterday. And why didn't you come to the police till now? I was frightened. And why did you try to hang yourself? From anxiety. What anxiety? That I should be accused of it. Well, that's the whole story. And now what do you suppose they deduced from that? Why, there's no supposing. There's a clue, such as it is, a fact. You wouldn't have your painter set free. Now they've simply taken him for the murderer. They haven't a shadow of doubt. That's nonsense. You are excited. 
But what about the earrings? You must admit that, if on the very same day and our earrings from the old woman's box have come into Nikolai's hands, they must have come there somehow. That's a good deal in such a case. How did they get there? How did they get there? Cried Razumahin. How can you, a doctor, whose duty it is to study man and who has more opportunity than anyone else for studying human nature, how can you fail to see the character of the man in the whole story? Don't you see at once that the answers he has given in the examination are the holy truth? They came into his hand precisely as he has told us, stepped on the box and picked it up. The holy truth. But didn't he own himself that he told a lie at first? Listen to me. Listen attentively. The porter and coach and Pastryakov and the other porter and the wife of the first porter and the woman who was sitting in the porter's lodge and the man Kriukov who had just got out of a cab at that minute and went in at the entry with the lady on his arm. That is eight or ten witnesses agree that Nikolai had Dmitri on the ground, was lying on him beating him, while Dmitri hung on to his hair, beating him, too. They lay right across the way, blocking the thoroughfare. They were sworn at on all sides while they like children, the very words of the witnesses, were falling over one another, squealing, fighting and laughing with the funniest faces, and... Chasing one another like children, they ran into the street. Now take careful note. The bodies upstairs were warm. You understand, warm when they found them. If they, or Nikolai alone, had murdered them and broken open the boxes, or simply taken part in the robbery, allow me to ask you one question. Do their state of mind, their squeals and giggles and childish scuffling at the gate fit in with axes, bloodshed, fiendish cunning, robbery, they just killed them, not five or ten minutes before, for the bodies were still warm, and at once, leaving the flat open, knowing that people would go there at once, flinging away their booty, they rolled about like children, laughing and attracting general attention. And there are a dozen witnesses to swear to that. Of course it is strange. It's impossible, indeed, but no, brother, no buts. And if the earrings being found in Nikolai's hands at the very day and hour of the murder constitutes an important piece of circumstantial evidence against him although the explanation given by him accounts for it, and therefore it does not tell seriously against him only must take into consideration the facts which prove him innocent, especially as they are facts that cannot be denied. And do you suppose, from the character of our legal system, that they will accept, or that they are in a position to accept? This fact resting simply on a psychological impossibility is irrefutable and conclusively breaking down the circumstantial evidence for the prosecution. No, they won't accept it. They certainly won't, because they found the jewel case and the man tried to hang himself, which he could not have done if he hadn't felt guilty. That's the point. That's what excites me. You must understand. Oh, I see you are excited. Wait a bit. I forgot to ask you, what proof is there that the box came from the old woman? That's been proved, said Razumahin with apparent reluctance, frowning. Kurt recognized the jewel case and gave the name of the owner, who proved conclusively that it was his. That's bad. Now another point. Did anyone see Nikolai at the time that Kurt and Pastryakov were going upstairs at first? And is there no evidence about that? Nobody did see him, Razumahin answered with vexation. That's the worst of it. Even Kutch and Pastryakov did not notice them on their way upstairs, though, indeed, their evidence could not have been worth much. They said they saw the flat was open and that there must be work going on in it, but they took no special notice and could not remember whether there actually were men at work in it. Hmm? So the only evidence for the defense is that they were beating one another and laughing. That constitutes a strong presumption, but how do you explain the facts yourself? How do I explain them? What is there to explain? It's clear. At any rate, the direction in which explanation is to be sought is clear, and the jewel case points to it. The real murderer dropped those earrings. The murderer was upstairs, locked in, when Korch and Pastryakov knocked at the door. Korch, like an ass, did not stay at the door, so the murderer popped out and ran down too, for he had no other way of escape. He hid from Korch, Pastryakov and the porter in the flat where Nikolai and Dmitri had just run out of it. 
He stopped there while the porter and others were going upstairs, waited till they were out of hearing, and then went calmly downstairs at the very minute when Dmitri and Nikolai ran out into the street and there was no one in the entry. Possibly he was seen, but not noticed. There are lots of people going in and out. He must have dropped the earrings out of his pocket when he stood behind the door and did not notice he dropped them because he had other things to think of. The jewel case is a conclusive proof that he did stand there. That's how I explain it. Too clever. No, my boy, you're too clever. That beats everything. But why? 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 Because everything fits too well it's too melodramatic. Patch. Razumahin was exclaiming, but at that moment the door opened and a personage came in who was a stranger to all present. Chapter 5 This was a gentleman no longer young, of a stiff and portly appearance, and a cautious and sour countenance. He began by stopping short in the doorway, staring about him with offensive and undisguised astonishment, as though asking himself what sort of place he had come to. Mistrustfully and with an affectation of being alarmed and almost affronted, he scanned Raskolnikov's low and narrow cabin. With the same amazement he stared at Raskolnikov, who lay and dressed, disheveled, and washed, on his miserable dirty sofa, looking fixedly at him. Then with the same deliberation he scrutinized the uncouth, unkempt figure and unshaven face of Razumahin, who looked him boldly and inquiringly in the face without rising from his seat. A constrained silence lasted for a couple of minutes, and then, as might be expected, some scene shifting took place, reflecting, probably from certain fairly unmistakable signs, that he would get nothing in this cabin by attempting to overawe them. The gentleman softened somewhat, and civilly, though with some severity, emphasizing every syllable of his question, addressed Zosimov, Rodion Romanovich Raskolnikov, a student, or formerly a student. Zosimov made a slight movement and would have answered, had not Razumahin anticipated him. Here he is lying on the sofa. What do you want? This familiar what do you want seemed to cut the ground from the feet of the pompous gentleman. He was turning to Razumahin, but checked himself in time and turned to Zosimov again. This is Raskolnikov, mumbled Zosimov, nodding towards him. Then he gave a prolonged yawn, opening his mouth as wide as possible. Then he leslie put his hand into his waistcoat pocket, pulled out a huge gold watch in a round hunter's case, opened it, looked at it and as slowly and leslie proceeded to put it back. Raskolnikov himself lay without speaking, on his back, gazing persistently, though without understanding, at the stranger. Now that his face was turned away from the strange flower on the paper, it was extremely pale and wore a look of anguish as though he had just undergone an agonizing operation or just been taken from the rack. But the newcomer gradually began to rouse his attention, then his wonder, then suspicion and even alarm. When Zosimov said this is Raskolnikov he jumped up quickly, sat on the sofa and with an almost defiant, but weak and breaking, voice articulated, Yes, I am Raskolnikov. What do you want? The visitor scrutinized him and pronounced impressively, Pyotr Patrovich Luzhin. I believe I have reason to hope that my name is not wholly unknown to you. But Raskolnikov, who had expected something quite different, gazed blankly and dreamily at him, making no reply, as though he heard the name of Pyotr Petrovich for the first time. Is it possible that you can up to the present have received no information? Asked Pyotr Petrovich, somewhat disconcerted. In reply Raskolnikov sank languidly back on the pillow, put his hands behind his head and gazed at the ceiling. A look of dismay came into Luzhin's face. Zosimov and Razumahin stared at him more inquisitively than ever, and at last he showed unmistakable signs of embarrassment. I had presumed and calculated, he faltered, that a letter posted more than ten days, if not a fortnight ago, I say, why are you standing in the doorway? Razumahin interrupted suddenly, if you've something to say, sit down, Nastasia, and you are so crowded. Nastasia, make room. Here's a chair, thread your way in. He moved his chair back from the table, made a little space between the table and his knees, and waited in a rather cramped position for the visitor to thread his way in. The minute was so chosen that it was impossible to refuse, and the visitor squeezed his way through, hurrying and stumbling. Reaching the chair, he sat down, looking suspiciously at Razumahin. No need to be nervous, the latter blurted out. 
Rodia has been ill for the last five days and delirious for three, but now he is recovering and has got an appetite. This is his doctor, who has just had a look at him. I am a comrade of Rodia's, like him, formerly a student, and now I am nursing him. So don't you take any notice of us, but go on with your business. Thank you, but shall I not disturb the invalid by my presence and conversation? Pyotr Petrovich asked of Zosimov. And no, mumbled Zosimov, you may amuse him. He yawned again. He has been conscious a long time, since the morning, went on Razumihin, whose familiarity seemed so much like unaffected good nature that Pyotr Petrovich began to be more cheerful, partly, perhaps, because this shabby and impudent person had introduced himself as a student. Your mama, began Lujin. Hm? Razumihin cleared his throat loudly. Lujin looked at him inquiringly. That's all right, go on. Lujin shrugged his shoulders. Your mama had commenced a letter to you while I was sojourning in her neighborhood. On my arrival here I purposely allowed a few days to elapse before coming to see you, in order that I might be fully assured that you were in full possession of the tidings. But now, to my astonishment I know, I know. Raskolnikov cried suddenly with impatient vexation. So you are the Fianc. I know, and that's enough. There was no doubt about Pyotr Petrovich's being offended this time, but he said nothing. He made a violent effort to understand what it all meant. There was a moment's silence. Meanwhile Raskolnikov, who had turned a little towards him when he answered, began suddenly staring at him again with marked curiosity, as though he had not had a good look at him yet, or as though something new had struck him. He rose from his pillow on purpose to stare at him. There certainly was something peculiar in Pyotr Petrovich's whole appearance, something which seemed to justify the title of Fianc so unceremoniously applied to him. In the first place, it was evident, far too much so indeed, that Pyotr Petrovich had made eager use of his few days in the capital to get himself up and rig himself out in expectation of his better that a perfectly innocent and permissible proceeding, indeed. Even his own, perhaps to complacent, Consciousness of the agreeable improvement in his appearance might have been forgiven in such circumstances, seeing that Pyotr Petrovich had taken up the rouleau of Fianc. All his clothes were fresh from the tailors and were all right except for being too new and too distinctly appropriate. Even the stylish new round hat had the same significance. Pyotr Petrovich treated it to respectfully and held it to carefully in his hands. The exquisite pair of lavender gloves, real Louvain, told the same tale, if only from the fact of his not wearing them, but carrying them in his hand for show. Light and youthful colors predominated in Pyotr Petrovich's attire. He wore a charming summer jacket of a fawn shade, light thin trousers, a waistcoat of the same, new and fine linen, a cravat of the lightest cambric with pink stripes on it, and the best of it was. This all suited Pyotr Petrovich. His very fresh and even handsome face looked younger than his forty-five years at all times. His dark, mutton-chop whiskers made an agreeable setting on both sides, growing thickly upon his shining, clean-shaven chin. Even his hair touched here and there with grey, though it had been combed and curled at a hairdresser's, did not give him a stupid appearance, as curled hair usually does, by inevitably suggesting a German on his wedding day. If there really was something unpleasing and repulsive in his rather good-looking and imposing countenance, it was due to quite other causes. After scanning Mr. Lujin unceremoniously, Raskolnikov smiled malignantly, sank back on the pillow and stared at the ceiling as before. But Mr. Lujin hardened his heart and seemed to determine to take no notice of their oddities. I feel the greatest regret at finding you in this situation, he began, again breaking the silence with an effort. If I had been aware of your illness I should have come earlier, but you know what business is. I have, too, a very important legal affair in the Senate, not to mention other preoccupations which you may well conjecture. I am expecting your mama and sister any minute. Raskolnikov made a movement and seemed about to speak. His face showed some excitement. Pyotr Petrovich paused, waited, but as nothing followed, he went on, any minute. I have found a lodging for them on their arrival. Where? Asked Raskolnikov weakly. Very near here, in Berkolyev's house. That's in Voskresensky, put in Razumihin. There are two stories of rooms, led by a merchant called Yashin. I've been there. 
Yes, rooms a disgusting place filthy, stinking and, what's more, of doubtful character. Things have happened there, and there are all sorts of queer people living there, and I went there about a scandalous business. It's cheap, though I could not, of course, find out so much about it, for I am a stranger in Petersburg myself, Pyotr Petrovich replied huffily. However, the two rooms are exceedingly clean, and as it is for so short a time I have already taken a permanent, that is, our future flat, he said, addressing Raskolnikov, and I am having it done up. And meanwhile I am myself cramped for room in a lodging with my friend Andrei Semyonovich Lebeziatnikov, in the flat of Madame Lipovixel. It was he who told me of Bokolyev's house, to Lebeziatnikov, said Raskolnikov slowly, as if recalling something. Yes, Andrei Semyonovich Lebeziatnikov, a clerk in the ministry. Do you know him? Yes, no, Raskolnikov answered. Excuse me, I fancied so from your inquiry. I was once his guardian, a very nice young man and advanced. I like to meet young people, one learns new things from them. Lujin looked round hopefully at them all. How do you mean? Asked Razumahin in the most serious and essential matters. Pyotr Petrovich replied as though delighted at the question. You see, it's ten years since I visited Petersburg. All the novelties, reforms, ideas have reached us in the provinces, but to see it all more clearly one must be in Petersburg. And it's my notion that you observe and learn most by watching the younger generation. And I confess I'm delighted at what. Your question is a wide one. I may be mistaken, but I fancy I find clearer views, more, so to say. Criticism, more practicality, that's true, Zosimov let drop. Nonsense, there's no practicality. Razumahin flew at him. Practicality is a difficult thing to find. It does not drop down from heaven. And for the last two hundred years we have been divorced from all practical life. Ideas, if you like, are fermenting, he said to Pyotr Petrovich, and desire for good exists, though it's in a childish form, and honesty you may find although there are crowds of brigands. Anyway, there's no practicality. Practicality goes well shod. I don't agree with you, Pyotr Petrovich replied with evident enjoyment. Of course, people do get carried away and make mistakes, but one must have indulgence. Those mistakes are merely evidence of enthusiasm for the cause and of abnormal external environment. If little has been done, the time has been but short of means I will not speak. It's my personal view, if you care to know, that something has been accomplished already. New valuable ideas, new valuable works are circulating in the place of our old dreamy and romantic authors. Literature is taking a maturer form. Many injurious prejudice have been rooted up and turned into ridicule. In a word, we have cut ourselves off irrevocably from the past, and that, to my thinking, is a great thing he's learnt it by heart to show off. Raskolnikov pronounced suddenly. What? Asked Pyotr Petrovich, not catching his words, but he received no reply. That's all true, Zosimov hastened to interpose. Isn't it so? Pyotr Petrovich went on, glancing affably at Zosimov. You must admit, he went on, addressing Razumahin with a shade of triumph and superciliousness almost added young men that there is an advance, or, as they say now, Progress in the name of science and economic truth a commonplace. No, not a commonplace. Hitherto, for instance, if I were told, love thy neighbor, what came of it? Pyotr Petrovich went on, perhaps with excessive haste. It came to my tearing my coat in half to share with my neighbor and we both were left half naked. As a Russian proverb has it, catch several hairs and you won't catch one. Science now tells us, Love yourself before all man, for everything in the world rests on self-interest. You love yourself and manage your own affairs properly and your coat remains whole. Economic truth adds that the better private affairs are organized in society the more whole coats, so to say the firmer are its foundations and the better is the common welfare organized too. Therefore, in acquiring wealth solely and exclusively for myself, I am acquiring, so to speak, for all and helping to bring to pass my neighbors getting a little more than a torn coat, and that not from private, personal liberality, but as a consequence of the general advance. The idea is simple, but unhappily it has been a long time reaching us, being hindered by idealism and sentimentality. 
and yet it would seem to want very little wit to perceive it. Excuse me, I've very little wit myself, Razumahin cut in sharply, and so let us drop it. I began this discussion with an object, but I've grown so sick during the last three years of this chattering to amuse oneself, of this incessant flow of commonplaces, always the same, that, by Jove, I blush even when other people talk like that. You are in a hurry, no doubt, to exhibit your requirements, and I don't blame you, that's quite pardonable. I only wanted to find out what sort of man you are, for so many unscrupulous people have got hold of the progressive cause of late and have so distorted in their own interests everything they touched that the whole cause has been dragged in the mire. That's enough. Excuse me, sir, said Lugine, affronted and speaking with excessive dignity. Do you mean to suggest so unceremoniously that I too owe, oh, my dear sir, how could I? Come, that's enough, Razumahin concluded, and he turned abruptly to Zosimov to continue their previous conversation. Pyotr Petrovich had the good sense to accept the disavowal. He made up his mind to take leave in another minute or two. I trust our acquaintance, he said, addressing Raskolnikov, may, upon your recovery and in view of the circumstances of which you are aware, become closer above all. I hope for your return to health, Raskolnikov did not even turn his head. Pyotr Petrovich began getting up from his chair. One of her customers must have killed her, Zosimov declared positively. Not a doubt of it, replied Razumahin. Porfiry doesn't give his opinion, but is examining all who have left pledges with her there. Examining them, Raskolnikov asked aloud. Yes. What then? Nothing. How does he get hold of them? Asked Zosimov. Korch has given the names of some of them. Other names are on the repers of the pledges, and some have come forward of themselves. It must have been a cunning and practiced ruffian. The boldness of it, the coolness, that's just what it wasn't, interposed Razumahin. That's what throws you all off the scent. But I maintain that he is not cunning, not practiced, and probably this was his first crime. The supposition that it was a calculated crime and a cunning criminal doesn't work. Suppose him to have been inexperienced and it's clear that it was only a chance that saved Hyman chance may do anything. Why, he did not foresee obstacles, perhaps. And how did he set to work? He took jewels worth ten or twenty rubles, stuffing his pockets with them, ransacked the old woman's trunks, her wrecks and they found fifteen hundred rubles, besides notes, in a box in the top drawer of the chest. He did not know how to rob, he could only murder. It was his first crime, I assure you, his first crime, he lost his head, and he got off more by luck than good counsel. You are talking of the murder of the old pawnbroker, I believe, Pyotr Petrovich put in, addressing Zosimov. He was standing, hat and gloves in hand, but before departing he felt disposed to throw off a few more intellectual phrases. He was evidently anxious to make a favorable impression and his vanity overcame his prudence. Yes. You've heard of it. Oh, yes, being in the neighborhood. Do you know the details? I can't say that, but another circumstance interests me in the case the whole question, so to say. Not to speak of the fact that crime has been greatly on the increase among the lower classes during the last five years. Not to speak of the cases of robbery and arson everywhere. What strikes me as the strangest thing is that in the higher classes, too, crime is increasing proportionately. In one place one hears of a student's robbing the mail on the high road. In another place people of good social position forge false banknotes. In Moscow of late a whole gang has been captured who used to forge lottery tickets. And one of the ringleaders was a lecturer in universal history. The now secretary abroad was murdered from some obscure motive of gain. And if this old woman, the pawnbroker, has been murdered by someone of a higher class in society for peasants don't pawn gold trinkets how are we to explain this demoralization of the civilized part of our society? There are many economic changes, put in Zosimov. How are we to explain it? Razumahin caught him up. It might be explained by our inveterate impracticality. How do you mean? What answer had your lecturer in Moscow to make to the question why he was forging notes? Everybody is getting rich one way or another, so I want to make haste to get rich too. I don't remember the exact words, but the upshot was that he wants money for nothing, without waiting or working. We've grown used to having everything ready-made, to walking on crutches, to having our food chewed for us. 
Then the great are struck, and every man showed himself in his true colors, but morality, and so to speak, principles, but why do you worry about it? Raskolnikov interposed suddenly. It's in accordance with your theory. In accordance with my theory. Why carry out logically the theory you were advocating just now, and it follows that people may be killed upon my word? Cried Luzhin. No, that's not so, put in Zosimov. Raskolnikov lay with a white face and twitching up a lip, breathing painfully. There's a measure in all things, Luzhin went on superciliously. Economic ideas are not an incitement to murder, and one has but to suppose, and is it true? Raskolnikov interposed once more suddenly, again in a voice quivering with fury and delight in insulting him. Is it true that you told your fiancée within an hour of her acceptance? That what pleased you most was that she was a beggar because it was better to raise a wife from poverty so that you may have complete control over her and reproach her with your being her benefactor. Upon my word, Lujin cried wrathfully and irritably, crimson with confusion, to distort my words in this way. Excuse me, allow me to assure you that the report which has reached you, or rather, let me say, has been conveyed to you, has no foundation in truth. And I suspect who in a word this arrow in a word, your mama she seemed to me in other things, with all her excellent qualities, of a somewhat high-flown and romantic way of thinking. But I was a thousand miles from supposing that she would misunderstand and misrepresent things in so fanciful a way. And indeed, indeed, I tell you what, cried Raskolnikov, raising himself on his pillow and fixing his piercing, glittering eyes upon him. I tell you what, what? Lujin stood still waiting with a defiant and offended face. Silence lasted for some seconds. Why, if ever again you dare to mention a single word about my mother, I shall send you flying downstairs. What's the matter with you? Cried Razumahin. So that's how it is. Lujin turned pale and bit his lip. Let me tell you, sir, he began deliberately, doing his utmost to restrain himself but breathing hard. At the first moment I saw you, you were ill-disposed to me, but I remained here on purpose to find out more. I could forgive a great deal in a sick man and a connection, but you never after this I am not ill, cried Raskolnikov. So much the worse go to hell. But Luzhin was already leaving without finishing his speech, squeezing between the table and the chair. Razumahin got up this time to let him pass without glancing at anyone, and not even nodding to Zosimov, who had for some time been making signs to him to let the sick man alone, he went out, lifting his hat to the level of his shoulders to avoid crushing it as he stooped to go out of the door. And even the curve of his spine was expressive of the horrible insult he had received. How could you, oh could you? Razumahin said, shaking his head in perplexity. Let me alone, let me alone, all of you. Raskolnikov cried in a frenzy. Will you ever leave off tormenting me? I am not afraid of you. I am not afraid of anyone. Anyone now. Get away from me. I want to be alone. 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 Come along, said Zosimov, nodding to Razumahin. But we can't leave him like this. Come along, Zosimov repeated insistently, and he went out. Razumahin thought a minute and ran to overtake him. It might be worse not to obey him, said Zosimov on the stairs. He mustn't be irritated. What's the matter with him? If only he could get some favorable shock, that's what would do it. At first he was better. You know he has got something on his mind, some fixed idea weighing on him. I am very much afraid so, he must have. Perhaps it's that gentleman, Pyotr Patrovich. From his conversation I gather he is going to marry his sister, and that he had received a letter about it just before his illness. Yes, confound the man. He may have upset the case altogether. But have you noticed? He takes no interest in anything. He does not respond to anything except one point on which he seems excited that's the murder. Yes, yes, Razumahin agreed. I noticed that, too. He is interested, frightened. It gave him a shock on the day he was ill in the police office. He fainted. Tell me more about that this evening and I'll tell you something afterwards. He interests me very much. In half an hour I'll go and see him again. There'll be no inflammation though. Thanks. And I'll wait with Pashenka meantime and will keep watch on him through Nastasya. Raskolnikov, left alone, looked with impatience and misery at Nastasya, but she still lingered. Won't you have some tea now? She asked. Later. I am sleepy. 
Leave me. He turned abruptly to the wall. Nostosia went out. Chapter 6. But as soon as she went out, he got up, latched the door, undid the parcel which Razumahin had brought in that evening and had tied up again and began dressing. Strange to say, he seemed immediately to have become perfectly calm, not a trace of his recent delirium nor of the panic fear that had haunted him of late. It was the first moment of a strange sudden calm. His movements were precise and definite, a firm purpose was evident in them. Today, today, he muttered to himself. He understood that he was still weak, but his intense spiritual concentration gave him strength and self-confidence. He hoped, moreover, that he would not fall down in the street. When he had dressed in entirely new clothes, he looked at the money lying on the table, and after a moment's thought put it in his pocket. It was twenty-five rubles. He took also all the copper change from the ten rubles spent by Razumahin on the clothes. Then he softly unlatched the door, went out, slipped downstairs and glanced in at the open kitchen door. Nastasia was standing with her back to him, blowing up the landlady's samovar. She heard nothing. Who would have dreamed of his going out, indeed? A minute later he was in the street. It was nearly eight o'clock. The sun was setting. It was as stifling as before, but he eagerly drank in the stinking, dusty town air. His head felt rather dizzy. A sort of savage energy gleamed suddenly in his feverish eyes and his wasted, pale and yellow face. He did not know and did not think where he was going. He had one thought only, that all this must be ended today, once for all, immediately, that he would not return home without it, because he would not go on living like that. How, with what to make an end? He had not an idea about it. He did not even want to think of it. He drove away thought. Thought tortured him. All he knew, all he felt was that everything must be changed one way or another. He repeated with desperate and immovable self-confidence and determination. From old habit he took his usual walk in the direction of the haymarket. A dark-haired young man with a barrel organ was standing in the road in front of a little general shop and was grinding out a very sentimental song. He was accompanying a girl of fifteen, who stood on the pavement in front of him. She was dressed up in a crinoline, a mental, and a straw hat with a flame-colored feather in it, all very old and shabby. In a strong and rather agreeable voice, cracked and coarsened by street singing, she sang in hope of getting a copper from the shop. Raskolnikov joined two or three listeners, took out a five-kopeck piece and put it in the girl's hand. She broke off abruptly on a sentimental high note, shouted sharply to the organ grinder come on, and both moved on to the next shop. Do you like street music? said Raskolnikov, addressing a middle-aged man standing idly by him. The man looked at him, startled and wondering. I love to hear singing to a street organ, said Raskolnikov, and his manner seemed strangely out of keeping with the subject he like it on cold. Dark. Demp autumn evenings they must be damp when all the passers-by have pale green, sickly faces. Or better still when wet snow is falling straight down, when there's no wind you know what I mean, and the street lamps shine through it I don't know. Excuse me muttered the stranger, frightened by the question and Raskolnikov's strange manner, and he crossed over to the other side of the street. Raskolnikov walked straight on and came out at the corner of the haymarket where the huckster and his wife had talked with Lizovata, but they were not there now. Recognizing the place, he stopped, looked round and addressed a young fellow in a red shirt who stood gaping before a corn chandler's shop. Isn't there a man who keeps a booth with his wife at this corner? All sorts of people keep booths here, answered the young men, glancing superciliously at Raskolnikov. What's his name? What he was christened? Aren't you a Zaraski man, too? Which province? The young man looked at Raskolnikov again. It's not a province, your excellency, but a district. Graciously forgive me, your excellency. Is that a tavern at the top there? Yes, it's an eating house and there's a billiard room and you'll find princesses there too. La la. Raskolnikov crossed the square. In that corner there was a dense crowd of peasants. He pushed his way into the thickest part of it, looking at the faces. He felt an unaccountable inclination to enter into conversation with people. But the peasants took no notice of him. They were all shouting in groups together. He stood and thought a little and took a turning to the right in the direction of V. He had often crossed that little street which turns at an angle, 
leading from the marketplace to Sadovi Street. Of late he had often felt drawn to wander about this district, when he felt depressed, that he might feel more so. Now he walked along, thinking of nothing. At that point there is a great block of buildings, entirely let out in dram shops and eating houses. Women were continually running in and out, bareheaded and in their indoor clothes. Here and there they gathered in groups, on the pavement, especially about the entrances to various festive establishments in the lower stories. From one of these a loud din, sounds of singing, the tinkling of a guitar and shouts of merriment floated into the street. A crowd of women were thronging round the door, some were sitting on the steps, others on the pavement, others were standing talking. A drunken soldier, smoking a cigarette, was walking near them in the road, swearing. He seemed to be trying to find his way somewhere, but had forgotten where. One beggar was quarreling with another, and a man dead drunk was lying right across the road. Raskolnikov joined the throng of women, who were talking in husky voices. They were bareheaded and wore cotton dresses and goatskin shoes. There were women of forty and some not more than seventeen. Almost all had blackened eyes. He felt strangely attracted by the singing and all the noise and uproar in the saloon below. Someone could be heard within dancing frantically, marking time with his heels to the sounds of the guitar and of a thin falsetto voice singing a jaunty air. He listened intently, gloomily and dreamily, bounding down at the entrance and peeping inquisitively in from the pavement. Oh, my handsome soldier don't beat me for nothing, trilled the thin voice of the singer. Raskolnikov felt a great desire to make out what he was singing, as though everything depended on that. Shall I go in? He thought, they are laughing, from drink, shall I get drunk, won't you come in, one of the women asked him, her voice was still musical and less thick than the others, she was young and not repulsive eth only one of the group, why, she's pretty, he said, drawing himself up and looking at her, she smiled, much pleased at the compliment, you're very nice looking yourself, she said, isn't he thin though, observed another woman in a deep bass, have you just come out of a hospital? They're all generals' daughters, it seems, but they have all snub noses, interposed a tipsy peasant with a sly smile on his face, wearing a loose coat. See how jolly they are. Go along with you. I'll go, sweetie. And he darted down into the saloon below. Raskolnikov moved on. I say, sir, the girl shouted after him. What is it? She hesitated. I'll always be pleased to spend an hour with you, kind gentleman, but now I feel shy. Give me six kopecks for a drink, there's a nice young man. Raskolnikov gave her what came first fifteen kopecks. Ah, what a good-natured gentleman. What's your name? Ask for Duclida. Well, that's too much, one of the women observed, shaking her head at Duclida. I don't know how you can ask like that. I believe I should drop with shame. Raskolnikov looked curiously at the speaker. She was a pockmarked wench of thirty, covered with bruises, with her upper lip swollen. She made her criticism quietly and earnestly. Where is it? thought Raskolnikov. Where is it I've read that someone condemned to death says or thinks, an hour before his death, that if he had to live on some high rock, on such a narrow ledge that he'd only room to stand, and the ocean, everlasting darkness, everlasting solitude, everlasting tempest around him. If he had to remain standing on a square yard of space all his life, a thousand years, eternity, it were better to live so than to die at once. Only to live, to live and live. Life, whatever it may be. How true it is. Good God, how true. Man is a vile creature, and vile is he who calls him vile for that. He added a moment later. He went into another street, bar the Palais de Crystal. Razumahin was just talking of the play de Crystal, but what on earth was it I wanted? Yes, the newspapers. Zosimov said he'd read it in the papers. Have you the papers? He asked, going into a very spacious and positively clean restaurant, consisting of several rooms, which were, however, rather empty. Two or three people were drinking tea, and in a room further away were sitting four men drinking champagne. Raskolnikov fancied that Zamatov was one of them, but he could not be sure at that distance. What if it is? He thought, will you have vodka? Asked the waiter. Give me some tea and bring me the papers, the old ones for the last five days, and I'll give you something. Yes, sir. Here's two days. 
No vodka. The old newspapers and the tea were brought. Raskolnikov sat down and began to look through them. Oh, damn, these are the items of intelligence. An accident on a staircase, spontaneous combustion of a shopkeeper from alcohol, a fire in Parsky, a fire in the Petersburg Quarter, another fire in the Petersburg Quarter, and another fire in the Petersburg Quarter. Ah, here it is. He found at last what he was seeking and began to read it. The lines danced before his eyes, but he read it all and began eagerly seeking later additions in the following numbers. His hands shook with nervous impatience as he turned the sheets. Suddenly someone sat down beside him at his table. He looked up, it was the head clerk Zemetov, looking just the same, with the rings on his fingers and the watch chain, with the curly, black hair, parted and pomaded, with the smart waistcoat, rather shabby coat and doubtful linen. He was in a good humor, at least he was smiling very gaily and good-humoredly. His dark face was rather flushed from the champagne he had drunk. What? You here? He began in surprise, speaking as though he'd known him all his life. Why, Razumahin told me only yesterday you were unconscious. How strange. And do you know I've been to see you? Raskolnikov knew he would come up to him. He laid aside the papers and turned to Zemetov. There was a smile on his lips, and a new shade of irritable impatience was apparent in that smile. I know you have, he answered. I've heard it. You looked for my sock. And you know Razumahin has lost his heart to you. He says you've been with him to loose Ivanovna so you know, the woman you tried to befriend, for whom you winked to the explosive lieutenant and he would not understand. Do you remember? How could he fail to understand it was quite clear, wasn't it? What a hothead he is. The explosive one. No, your friend Razumahin. You must have a jolly life, Mr. Zemetov, entrance free to the most agreeable places. Who's been pouring champagne into you just now? We've just been having a drink together. You talk about pouring it into me. By way of a fee. You profit by everything. Raskolnikov left. It's all right, my dear boy. He added, slapping Zemetov on the shoulder. I am not speaking from temper, but in a friendly way. For sport, as that workman of yours said when he was scuffling with Dmitri, in the case of the old woman. How do you know about it? Perhaps I know more about it than you do. How strange you are. I am sure you are still very unwell. You oughtn't to have come out. Oh, do I seem strange to you? Yes. What are you doing? Reading the papers. Yes. There's a lot about the fires. No, I am not reading about the fires. Here he looked mysteriously at Zamatov. His lips were twisted again in a mocking smile. No, I am not reading about the fires. He went on, winking at Zamatov. But confess now, my dear fellow, you're awfully anxious to know what I'm reading about. I am not in the least. Mayn't I ask a question? Why do you keep on? Listen, you are a man of culture and education. I was in the sixth class at the gymnasium, said Zemetov with some dignity. Sixth class? Ah, my cocksparrow. With your parting and your rings you are a gentleman of fortune. Foo, what a charming boy. Here Raskolnikov broke into a nervous left right in Zemetov's face. The latter drew back, more amazed than offended. Foo, how strange you are. Zemetov repeated very seriously. I can't help thinking you are still delirious. I am delirious. You are fibbing, my cocksparer. So I am strange. You find me curious, do you? Yes, curious. Shall I tell you what I was reading about, what I was looking for? See what a lot of papers I've made them bring me. Suspicious, eh? Well, what is it? You prick up your ears. How do you mean I prick up my ears? I'll explain that afterwards, but now, my boy, I declare to you no. Better, I confess no. That's not right either. I make a deposition and you take it. I depose that I was reading, that I was looking and searching. He screwed up his eyes and paused. I was searching and came here on purpose to do it for news of the murder of the old pawnbroker woman. He articulated at last, almost in a whisper, bringing his face exceedingly close to the face of Zamatov. Zamatov looked at him steadily, without moving or drawing his face away. What struck Zamatov afterwards as the strangest part of it all was that silence followed for exactly a minute, and that they gazed at one another all the while. What if you have been reading about it? He cried at last, perplexed and impatient. That's no business of mine. 
What of it? The same old woman, Raskolnikov, went on in the same whisper, not heeding Zamatov's explanation about whom you were talking in the police office. You remember when I fainted. Well, do you understand now? What do you mean? Understand what? Zamatov brought out, almost alarmed. Raskolnikov's set and earnest face was suddenly transformed, and he suddenly went off into the same nervous laugh as before, as though utterly unable to restrain himself. And in one flash he recalled with extraordinary vividness of sensation a moment in the recent past, that moment when he stood with the axe behind the door, while the latch trembled and the man outside swore and shook it, and he had a sudden desire to shout at them, to swear at them, to put out his tongue at them, to mock them, to laugh, and laugh, and laugh. You were either mad, or began Zamatov, and he broke off, as though stunned by the idea that had suddenly flashed into his mind. Or, or what, what, come, tell me. Nothing, said Zamatov, getting angry. It's all nonsense. Both were silent. After his sudden fit of laughter, Raskolnikov became suddenly thoughtful and melancholy. He put his elbow on the table and leaned his head on his hand. He seemed to have completely forgotten Zamatov. The silence lasted for some time. Why don't you drink your tea? It's getting cold, said Zamatov. What? Tea? Oh, yes. Raskolnikov sipped the glass, put a morsel of bread in his mouth and, suddenly looking at Zamatov, seemed to remember everything and pulled himself together. At the same moment his face resumed its original mocking expression. He went on drinking tea. There have been a great many of these crimes lately, said Zamatov. Only the other day I read in the Moscow news that a whole gang of false coiners had been caught in Moscow. It was a regular society. They used to forge tickets. Oh, but it was a long time ago. I read about it a month ago, Raskolnikov answered calmly. So you consider them criminals? He added, smiling. Of course they are criminals. They, they are children, simpletons, not criminals. Why, half a hundred people meeting for such an object were an idea. Three would be too many, and then they want to have more faith in one another than in themselves. One has only to blab in his cups and it all collapses. Simpletons. They engaged in trustworthy people to change the notes. What a thing to trust to a casual stranger. Well, let us suppose that these simpletons succeed and each makes a million, and what follows for the rest of their lives. Each is dependent on the others for the rest of his life. Better hang oneself at once. And they did not know how to change the notes either. The man who changed the notes took five thousand rubles, and his hands trembled. He counted the first four thousand but did not count the fifth thousand was in such a hurry to get the money into his pocket and run away. Of course he roused suspicion, and the whole thing came to a crash through one fool. Is it possible that his hands trembled, observed Zamatov? Yes, that's quite possible. That, I feel quite sure, is possible. Sometimes one can't stand things, can't stand that. Why could you stand it then? No, I couldn't for the sake of a hundred rubles to face such a terrible experience, to go with false notes into a bank where it's their business to spot that sort of thing. No, I should not have the face to do it, would you? Raskolnikov had an intense desire again to put his tongue out. Shivers kept running down his spine. I should do it quite differently, Raskolnikov began. This is how I would change the notes. I'd count the first thousand three or four times backwards and forwards. Looking at every note and then I'd set to the second thousand. I'd count that halfway through and then hold some fifty ruble note to the light. Then turn it. Then hold it to the light again to see whether it was a good one. I am afraid, I would say. A relation of mine lost twenty-five rubles the other day through a false note. And then I'd tell them the whole story. And after I began counting the third, no, excuse me, I would say. I fancy I made a mistake in the seventh hundred in that second thousand, I am not sure, and so I would give up the third thousand and go back to the second and so on to the end, and when I had finished, I'd pick out one from the fifth and one from the second thousand and take them again to the light and ask again, change them, please, and put the clerk into such a stew that he would not know how to get rid of me. When I'd finished and had gone out, I'd come back. No, excuse me, and ask for some explanation. That's how I'd do it. Foo, what terrible things you say. 
said Zamatov, laughing. But all that is only talk. I dare say when it came to deeds you'd make a slip. I believe that even a practiced, desperate man cannot always reckon on himself, much less you and I. To take an example near home that old woman murdered in our district. The murderer seems to have been a desperate fellow. He risked everything in open daylight, was saved by a miracle but his hands shook. 2. He did not succeed in robbing the place, he couldn't stand it. That was clear from the Raskolnikov seemed offended. Clear. Why don't you catch him then? He cried, maliciously jibing at Zamatov. Well, they will catch him. Who? You. Do you suppose you could catch him? You've a tough job. A great point for you is whether a man is spending money or not. If he had no money and suddenly begins spending, he must be the man, so that any child can mislead you. The fact is they always do that, though, answered Zamatov. A man will commit a clever murder at the risk of his life and then at once he goes drinking in a tavern. They're caught spending money, they're not all as cunning as you are. You wouldn't go to a tavern, of course. Raskolnikov frowned and looked steadily at Zamatov. You seem to enjoy the subject and would like to know how I should behave in that case, too. He asked with displeasure. I should like to, Zamatov answered firmly and seriously. Somewhat too much earnestness began to appear in his words and looks. Very much, very much. All right, then. This is how I should behave, Raskolnikov began, again bringing his face close to Zamatov's, again staring at him and speaking in a whisper, so that the letter positively shuddered. This is what I should have done. I should have taken the money and jewels. I should have walked out of there and have gone straight to some deserted place with fences round it and scarcely anyone to be seen, some kitchen garden or place of that sort. I should have looked out beforehand some stone weighing a hundred weight or more which had been lying in the corner from the time the house was built. I would lift that stone if there would sure to be a hollow under it, and I would put the jewels and money in that hole. Then I'd roll the stone back so that it would look as before, would press it down with my foot and walk away. And for a year or two, three maybe, I would not touch it. And, well, they could search. There'd be no trace. You are a madman, said Zamatov, and for some reason he just spoke in a whisper and moved away from Raskolnikov, whose eyes were glittering. He had turned fearfully pale and his upper lip was twitching and quivering. He bent down as close as possible to Zamatov, and his lips began to move without uttering a word. This lasted for half a minute. He knew what he was doing, but could not restrain himself. The terrible word trembled on his lips, like the latch on that door. In another moment it will break out. In another moment he will let it go. He will speak out. And what if it was I who murdered the old woman and Lizavata? He said suddenly and realized what he had done. Zamatov looked wildly at him and turned white as the tablecloth. His face wore a contorted smile. But is it possible? He brought out faintly. Raskolnikov looked wrathfully at him. Own up that you believed it. Yes, you did. Not a bit of it. I believe it less than ever now, Zamatov cried hastily. I've caught my cocksparer. So you did believe it before, if now you believe less than ever. Not at all, cried Zamatov, obviously embarrassed. Have you been frightening me so as to lead up to this? You don't believe it then. What were you talking about behind my back when I went out of the police office? And why did the explosive lieutenant question me after I fainted? Hey, there, he shouted to the waiter, getting up and taking his cap. How much? Thirty kopecks, the latter replied, running up. And there is twenty kopecks for vodka. See what a lot of money. He held out his shaking hand to Zamatov with notes in it. Red notes and blue. Twenty-five rubles. Where did I get them? And where did my new clothes come from? You know I had not a kopeck. You've cross-examined my landlady, I'll be bound. Well, that's enough. I says cause, till we meet again. He went out, trembling all over from a sort of wild hysterical sensation, in which there was an element of insufferable rapture. Yet he was gloomy and terribly tired. His face was twisted as after a fit. His fatigue increased rapidly. Any shock, any irritating sensation stimulated and revived his energies at once but his strength failed as quickly when the stimulus was removed. Zamatov, laughed alone, sat for a long time in the same place, plunged in thought. 
Raskolnikov had unwittingly worked a revolution in his brain on a certain point and had made up his mind for him conclusively. Ilya Petrovich is a blockhead, he decided. Raskolnikov had hardly opened the door of the restaurant when he stumbled against Razumihin on the steps. They did not see each other till they almost knocked against each other. For a moment they stood looking each other up and down. Razumihin was greatly astounded. Then anger, real anger gleamed fiercely in his eyes. So here you are, he shouted at the top of his voice, you ran away from your bad. And here I've been looking for you under the sofa. We went up to the garret. I almost beat Nastasia on your account. And here he is after all. Rodya, what is the meaning of it? Tell me the whole truth. Confess. Do you hear? It means that I'm sick to death of you all and I want to be alone, Raskolnikov answered calmly. Alone. When you are not able to walk, when your face is as white as a sheet and you are gasping for breath. Idiot, what have you been doing in the Palais de Crystal? Own up at once. Let me go, said Raskolnikov and tried to pass him. This was too much for Razumahin. He gripped him firmly by the shoulder. Let you go. You dare tell me to let you go. Do you know what I'll do with you directly? I'll pick you up, tie you up in a bundle, carry you home under my arm and lock you up. Listen, Razumahin, Raskolnikov began quietly, apparently calm, can't you see that I don't want your benevolence? A strange desire you have to shower benefits on a man who curses them, who feels them a burden in fact. Why did you seek me out at the beginning of my illness? Maybe I was very glad to die. Didn't I tell you plainly enough today that you were torturing me, that I was sick of you? You seem to want to torture people. I assure you that all that is seriously hindering my recovery, because it's continually irritating me. You saw Zosimov went away just now to avoid irritating me. You leave me alone too, for goodness sake. What right have you, indeed, to keep me by force? Don't you see that I'm in possession of all my faculties now? How? How can I persuade you not to persecute me with your kindness? I may be ungrateful, I may be mean, only let me be, for God's sake, let me be. Let me be. Let me be. He began calmly, gloating beforehand over the venomous phrases he was about to utter, but finished, panting for breath, in a frenzy, as he had been with Lujin. Razumahin stood a moment, thought and let his hand drop. Well, go to hell then, he said gently and thoughtfully. Stay, he roared, as Raskolnikov was about to move. Listen to me. Let me tell you that you are all a set of babbling, posing idiots. If you've any little trouble you brood over it like a han over an egg, and you are plagiarists even in that, there isn't a sign of independent life in you. You are made of spermaceti ointment and you've lymph in your veins instead of blood. I don't believe in any one of you. In any circumstances the first thing for all of you is to be unlike a human being. Stop! He cried with redoubled fury, noticing that Raskolnikov was again making a move man fear me out. You know I'm having a housewarming this evening. I dare say they've arrived by now, but I left my uncle there a just ran in to receive the guests. And if you weren't a fool, a common fool, a perfect fool, if you were an original instead of a translation you see, Rodia, I recognize you're a clever fellow, but you're a fool. And if you weren't a fool you'd come round to me this evening instead of wearing out your boots in the street. Since you have gone out, there's no help for it. I'd give you a snug easy chair. My landlady has won a cup of tea, company. Or you could lie on the Sophany where you would be with us. Zosimov will be there too. Will you come? No, our rubbish. Razumahin shouted, out of patience. How do you know? You can't answer for yourself. You don't know anything about it. Thousands of times I've fought tooth and nail with people and run back to them afterwards. One feels ashamed and goes back to a man. So remember, Pochinkov's house on the third story. Why, Mr. Razumahin, I do believe you'd let anybody beat you from sheer benevolence. Beat? Whom? Me. I'd twist his nose off at the mere idea. Pochinkov's house, 47, Babushkin's flat. I shall not come, Razumahin. Raskolnikov turned and walked away. I bet you will, Razumahin shouted after him. I refuse to know you if you don't. Stay. Hey, is Zamatov in there? Yes. Did you see him? Yes. Talked to him? Yes. What about? Confound you, don't tell me then. Pochinkov's house, 47, Babushkin's flat, remember. 
Raskolnikov walked on and turned the corner into Sadovi Street. Razumahin looked after him thoughtfully. Then, with a wave of his hand, he went into the house but stopped short of the stairs. Confounded, he went on almost aloud. He talked sensibly, but yet I am a fool. As if Medman didn't talk sensibly. And this was just what Zosimov seemed afraid of. He struck his finger on his forehead. What if how could I let him go off alone? He may drown himself. Atch, what a blunder. I can't. And he ran back to overtake Raskolnikov, but there was no trace of him. With a curse, he returned with rapid steps to the Palladi Crystal to question Zamatov. Raskolnikov walked straight to Axe Bridge, stood in the middle, and leaning both elbows on the rail stared into the distance. On parting with Razumahin, he felt so much weaker that he could scarcely reach this place. He longed to sit or lie down somewhere in the street, standing over the water. He gazed mechanically at the last pink flush of the sunset, at the row of houses growing dark in the gathering twilight, at one distant attic window on the left bank, flashing as though on fire in the last rays of the setting sun, at the darkening water of the canal, and the water seemed to catch his attention. At last red circles flashed before his eyes, the houses seemed moving, the passers-by, the canal banks, the carriages, all danced before his eyes. Suddenly he started, saved again perhaps from swooning by an uncanny and hideous sight. He became aware of someone standing on the right side of him. He looked and saw a tall woman with a kerchief on her head, with a long, yellow, wasted face and red sunken eyes. She was looking straight at him, but obviously she saw nothing and recognized no one. Suddenly she leaned her right hand on the parapet, lifted her right leg over the railing, then her left, and threw herself into the canal. The filthy water parted and swallowed up its victim for a moment, but an instant later the drowning woman floated to the surface, moving slowly with the current, her head and legs in the water, her skirt inflated like a balloon over her back. A woman drowning. A woman drowning, shouted dozens of voices, people ran up, both banks were thronged with spectators, on the bridge people crowded about Raskolnikov, pressing up behind him. Mercy on it, it's our Afrosinia. A woman cried tearfully close by, mercy, save her, kind people, pull her out. A boat, a boat was shouted in the crowd, but there was no need of a boat, a policeman ran down the steps to the canal threw off his great coat and his boots and rushed into the water. It was easy to reach her. She floated within a couple of yards from the steps. He caught hold of her clothes with his right hand and with his left seized a pole which a comrade held out to him. The drowning woman was pulled out at once. They laid her on the granite pavement of the embankment. She soon recovered consciousness, raised her head, sat up and began sneezing and coughing, stupidly wiping her wet dress with her hands. She said nothing. She's drunk herself out of her senses. The same woman's voice wailed at her side. Out of her senses. The other day she tried to hang herself. We cut her down. I ran out to the shop just now. Left my little girl to look after her and here she's in trouble again. A neighbor. Gentleman. A neighbor. We live close by. The second house from the end. See yonder. The crowd broke up. The police still remained round the woman. Someone mentioned the police station. Raskolnikov looked on with a strange sensation of indifference and apathy. He felt disgusted. No, that's loathsome water, it's not good enough, he muttered to himself. Nothing will come of it, he added. No use to wait. What about the police office? And why isn't Zemetov at the police office? The police office is open till ten o'clock. He turned his back to the railing and looked about him. Very well, then, he said resolutely. He moved from the bridge and walked in the direction of the police office. His heart felt hollow and empty. He did not want to think. Even his depression had passed. There was not a trace now of the energy with which he had set out to make an end of it all. Complete apathy had succeeded to it. Well, it's a way out of it, he thought, walking slowly and listlessly along the canal bank. Anyway, I'll make an end, if I want to. But is it a way out? What does it matter? There'll be the square yard of Spocha, but what an end. Is it really the end? Shall I tell them or not? Oh damn, how tired I am. If I could find somewhere to sit or lie down soon. What I am most ashamed of is its being so stupid. But I don't care about that either. What idiotic ideas come into one's head? 
to reach the police office he had to go straight forward and take the second turning to the left. It was only a few paces away, but at the first turning he stopped and, after a minute's thought, turned into a side street and went to streets out of his way, possibly without any object, or possibly to delay a minute and gain time. He walked, looking at the ground, suddenly someone seemed to whisper in his ear. He lifted his head and saw that he was standing at the very gate of the house. He had not passed it, he had not been near it since that evening. An overwhelming, unaccountable prompting drew him on. He went into the house, passed through the gateway, then into the first entrance on the right, and began mounting the familiar staircase to the fourth story. The narrow, steep staircase was very dark. He stopped at each landing and looked round him with curiosity. On the first landing the framework of the window had been taken out. That wasn't so then, he thought. Here was the flat on the second story where Nikolai and Dmitri had been working. It's shut up and the door newly painted, so it's to let. Then the third story and the fourth. Here, he was perplexed to find the door of the flat wide open. There were men there. He could hear voices. He had not expected that. After brief hesitation he mounted the last stairs and went into the flat. It, too, was being done up. There were workmen in it. This seemed to amaze him. He somehow fancied that he would find everything as he left it, even perhaps the corpses in the same places on the floor. And now, bare walls, no furniture, it seemed strange. He walked to the window and sat down on the windowsill. There were two workmen, both young fellows, but one much younger than the other. They were papering the walls with a new white paper covered with lilac flowers, instead of the old, dirty, yellow one. Raskolnikov for some reason felt horribly annoyed by this. He looked at the new paper with dislike, as though he felt sorry to have it all so changed. The workmen had obviously stayed beyond their time and now they were hurriedly rolling up their paper and getting ready to go home. They took no notice of Raskolnikov's coming in. They were talking. Raskolnikov folded his arms and listened. She comes to me in the morning, said the elder to the younger, very early, all dressed up. Where are you preening and prinking? Says I, I am ready to do anything to please you, tit Vasilich. That's a way of going on. And she dressed up like a regular fashion book. And what is a fashion book? The younger one asked. He obviously regarded the other as an authority. A fashion book is a lot of pictures, colored, and they come to the tailors here every Saturday, by post from abroad, to show folks how to dress, the male sex as well as the female. Their pictures. The gentlemen are generally wearing fur coats and for the ladies fluffles. They're beyond anything you can fancy. There's nothing you can't find in Petersburg. The younger cried enthusiastically. Except father and mother. There's everything. Except them. There's everything to be found. My boy. The elder declared sententiously. Raskolnikov got up and walked into the other room where the strong box, the bed, and the chest of drawers had been. The room seemed to him very tiny without furniture in it. The paper was the same. The paper in the corner showed where the case of icons had stood. He looked at it and went to the window. The elder workman looked at him askance. What do you want? He asked suddenly. Instead of answering Raskolnikov went into the passage and pulled the bell. The same bell, the same cracked note. He rang it a second and a third time. He listened and remembered. The hideous and agonizingly fearful sensation he had felt then began to come back more and more vividly. He shuddered at every ring and it gave him more and more satisfaction. Well, what do you want? Who are you? The workman shouted, going out to him. Raskolnikov went inside again. I want to take a flat, he said. I am looking round. It's not the time to look at rooms at night. And you ought to come up with the porter. The floors have been washed. Will they be painted? Raskolnikov went on. Is there no blood? What blood? Why, the old woman and her sister were murdered here. There was a perfect pool there. But who are you? The workman cried, uneasy. Who am I? Yes. You want to know? Come to the police station. I'll tell you. The workman looked at him in amazement. It's time for us to go. We are late. Come along, Alyoshka. We must lock up, said the elder workman. Very well, come along, said Raskolnikov indifferently, and going out first, he went slowly downstairs. Hey, porter, he cried in the gateway. 
At the entrance, several people were standing, staring at the passers-by. The two porters, a peasant woman, a man in a long coat, and a few others. Raskolnikov went straight up to them. What do you want? Asked one of the porters. Have you been to the police office? I've just been there. What do you want? Is it open? Of course. Is the assistant there? He was there for a time. What do you want? Raskolnikov made no reply, but stood beside them lost in thought. He's been to look at the flat, said the elder workman, coming forward. Which flat? Where we are at work. Where have you washed away the blood? Says he. Other has been a murder here, says he, and I've come to take it. And he began ringing at the bell, all but broke it. Come to the police station, says he. I'll tell you everything there. He wouldn't leave us. The porter looked at Raskolnikov, frowning and perplexed. Who are you? He shouted as impressively as he could. I am Rodion Romanovich Raskolnikov, formerly a student. I live in Shill's house, not far from here. Flat number 14, asked the porter. He knows me. Raskolnikov said all this in a lazy, dreamy voice, not turning round, but looking intently into the darkening street. Why have you been to the flat? To look at it. What is there to look at? Take him straight to the police station. The man in the long coat jerked in abruptly. Raskolnikov looked intently at him over his shoulder and said in the same slow, lazy tones, Come along. Yes, take him. The man went on more confidently. Why was he going into that? What's in his mind? Uh, he's not drunk, but God knows what's the matter with him, muttered the workman. But what do you want? The porter shouted again, beginning to get angry in earnest. We are you hanging about? You funk the police station then, said Raskolnikov jeeringly. How funk it? Why are you hanging about? He's a rogue, shouted the peasant woman. Why waste time talking to him? Cried the other porter, a huge peasant in a full open coat and with keys on his belt. Get along. He is a rogue and no mistake. Get along. And seizing Raskolnikov by the shoulder, he flung him into the street. He lurched forward, but recovered his footing, looked at the spectators in silence and walked away. Strange man, observed the workman. There are strange folks about nowadays, said the woman. You should have taken him to the police station all the same, said the man in the long coat. Better have nothing to do with him, decided the big porter. A regular rogue. Just what he wants, you may be sure, but once take him up, you won't get rid of him. We know the sort. Shall I go there or not? Thought Raskolnikov, standing in the middle of the thoroughfare at the crossroads, and he looked about him, as though expecting from someone a decisive word. But no sound came. All was dead and silent like the stones on which he walked. Dead to him, to him alone. All at once at the end of the street, two hundred yards away, in the gathering dusk he saw a crowd and heard talk and shouts. In the middle of the crowd stood a carriage. A light gleamed in the middle of the street. What is it? Raskolnikov turned to the right and went up to the crowd. He seemed to clutch at everything and smiled coldly when he recognized it, for he had fully made up his mind to go to the police station and knew that it would all soon be over. Chapter 7 An elegant carriage stood in the middle of the road with a pair of spirited grey horses. There was no one in it, and the coachman had got off his box and stood by. The horses were being held by the bridle. A mass of people had gathered round, the police standing in front. One of them held a lighted lantern which he was turning on something lying close to the wheels. Everyone was talking, shouting, exclaiming. The coachman seemed at a loss and kept repeating, What a misfortune! Good Lord, what a misfortune! Raskolnikov pushed his way in as far as he could and succeeded at last in seeing the object of the commotion and interest. On the ground a man who had been run over lay apparently unconscious and covered with blood. He was very badly dressed, but not like a workman. Blood was flowing from his head and face. His face was crushed, mutilated and disfigured. He was evidently badly injured. Merciful heaven, wailed the coachman. What more could I do? If I'd been driving fast or had not shouted to him, but I was going quietly, not in a hurry. Everyone could see I was going along just like everybody else. A drunken man can't walk straight, we all know. I saw him crossing the street, staggering and almost falling. I shouted again and a second and a third time. Then I held the horses in, but he fell straight under their feet. 
Either he did it on purpose or he was very tipsy. The horses are young and ready to take fright they started. He screamed that made them worse. That's how it happened. That's just how it was, a voice in the crowd confirmed. He shouted, that's true. He shouted three times, another voice declared. Three times it was, we all heard it, shouted a third. But the coachman was not very much distressed and frightened. It was evident that the carriage belonged to a rich and important person who was awaiting it somewhere. The police, of course, were in no little anxiety to avoid upsetting his arrangements. All they had to do was to take the injured man to the police station and the hospital. No one knew his name. Meanwhile Raskolnikov had squeezed and then stooped closer over him. The lantern suddenly lighted up the unfortunate man's face. He recognized him. I know him. I know him. He shouted, pushing to the front. It's a government clerk retired from the service, Marmolodov. He lives close by in Kozel's house. Make haste for a doctor. I will pay. See. He pulled money out of his pocket and showed it to the policeman. He was in violent agitation. The police were glad that they had found out who the man was. Raskolnikov gave his own name and address, and, as earnestly as if it had been his father, he besought the police to carry the unconscious Marmolodov to his lodging at once. Just here, three houses away, he said eagerly, the house belongs to Kozel, a rich German. He was going home, no doubt drunk. I know him. He is a drunkard. He has a family there, a wife, children. He has one daughter. It will take time to take him to the hospital, and there is sure to be a doctor in the house. I'll pay. I'll pay. At least he will be looked after at home. They will help him at once. But he'll die before you get him to the hospital. He managed to slip something unseen into the policeman's hand. But the thing was straightforward and legitimate. And in any case, help was closer here. They raised the injured man. People volunteered to help. Kozel's house was 30 yards away. Raskolnikov walked behind, carefully holding Marmolodov's head and showing the way. This way, this way. We must take him upstairs head foremost. Turn round. I'll pay. I'll make it worth your while, he muttered. Katrina Ivanovna had just begun, as she always did at every free moment, walking to and fro in her little room from window to stove and back again, with her arms folded across her chest, talking to herself and coughing. Of late she had begun to talk more than ever to her eldest girl, Palenka, a child of ten, who, though there was much she did not understand, understood very well that her mother needed her, and so always watched her with her big clever eyes and strove her utmost to appear to understand. This time Palenka was undressing her little brother, who had been unwell all day and was going to bed. The boy was waiting for her to take off his shirt, which had to be washed at night. He was sitting straight and motionless on a chair, with a silent, serious face, with his legs stretched out straight before him, heels together and toes turned out. He was listening to what his mother was saying to his sister, sitting perfectly still with pouting lips and wide open eyes, just as all good little boys have to sit when they are undressed to go to bed. A little girl, still younger, dressed literally in rags, stood at the screen, waiting for her turn. The door onto the stairs was open to relieve them a little from the clouds of tobacco smoke which floated in from the other rooms and brought on long terrible fits of coughing in the poor, consumptive woman. Katerina Ivanovna seemed to have grown even thinner during that week and the hectic flush on her face was brighter than ever. You wouldn't believe, you can't imagine, Palenka, she said, walking about the room. What a happy luxurious life we had in my papa's house and how this drunkard has brought me and will bring you all to ruin. Papa was a civil colonel and only a step from being a governor, so that everyone who came to see him said, we look upon you, Ivan Mihailovich, as our governor. When I when she coughed violently, oh, cursed life, she cried, clearing her throat and pressing her hands to her breast. When I went at the last ball at the marshal's, Princess Besmani saw Muro gave me the blessing when your father and I were married. Palankash asked at once, isn't that the pretty girl who danced the shawl dance at the breaking up? You must man that tear, you must take your needle and darn it as I showed you, or tomorrow cow, cough, cough will make the hole bigger, she articulated with effort. Prince Skagelskoy, a Kamajunka, had just come from Petersburg, then he danced the mazurka with me and wanted to make me an offer next day, 
but I thanked him in flattering expressions and told him that my heart had long been another's. That other was your father, Polier. Papa was fearfully angry. Is the water ready? Give me the shirt and the stockings. Leader, said she to the youngest one, you must manage without your chemise tonight and lay your stockings out with it. I'll wash them together. How is it that drunken vagabond doesn't come in? He has worn his shirt till it looks like a dish clout. He has torn it to rags. I'd do it all together so as not to have to work tonight's running. Oh, dear. Cough, 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 cough. Again. What's this? She cried, noticing a crowd in the passage and the men, who were pushing into her room, carrying a burden. What is it? What are they bringing? Mercy on us. Where are we to put him? Asked the policeman, looking round when Marmaladov, unconscious and covered with blood, had been carried in, on the sofa. Put him straight on the sofa, with his head this way, Raskolnikov showed him. Run over in the road. Drunk. Someone shouted in the passage. Katerina Ivanovna stood, turning white and gasping for breath. The children were terrified. Little Lida screamed, rushed to Palenka and clutched at her, trembling all over. Having laid Marmaladov down, Raskolnikov flew to Katerina Ivanovna. For God's sake be calm, don't be frightened. He said, speaking quickly, he was crossing the road and was run over by a carriage. Don't be frightened, he will come too. I told them bring him here, I've been here already. You remember, he will come too, I'll pay. He's done it this time. Katerina Ivanovna cried despairingly and she rushed to her husband. Raskolnikov noticed at once that she was not one of those women who swoon easily. She instantly placed under the luckless men's head a pillow, which no one had thought of and began undressing and examining him. She kept her head, forgetting herself, biting her trembling lips and stifling the screams which were ready to break from her. Raskolnikov meanwhile induced someone to run for a doctor. There was a doctor, it appeared, next door but one. I've sent for a doctor, he kept assuring Katerina Ivanovna. Don't be uneasy, I'll pay. Haven't you water? And give me a napkin or a towel, anything, as quick as you can. He is injured, but not killed, believe me. We shall see what the doctor says. Katerina Ivanovna ran to the window. There, on a broken chair in the corner, a large earthenware basin full of water had been stood, in readiness for washing her children's and husband's linen that night. This washing was done by Katerina Ivanovna at night at least twice a week if not oftener, for the family had come to such a pass that they were practically without change of linen, and Katerina Ivanovna could not endure uncleanliness and, rather than see dirt in the house, she preferred to wear herself out at night, working beyond her strength when the rest were asleep, so as to get the wet linen hung on a line and dry by the morning. She took up the basin of water at Raskolnikov's request, but almost fell down with her burden but the latter had already succeeded in finding a towel, wetted it and began washing the blood off Marmolodov's face. Katerina Ivanovna stood by, breathing painfully and pressing her hands to her breast. She was in need of attention herself. Raskolnikov began to realize that he might have made a mistake in having the injured man brought here. The policeman, too, stood in hesitation. Palenka, cried Katerina Ivanovna, run to Sonia, make haste. If you don't find her at home, leave word that her father has been run over and that she is to come here at once when she comes in. Run, Palanka. There, put on the shawl. Run your fastest, cried the little boy on the chair suddenly, after which he relapsed into the same dumb rigidity, with round eyes, his heels thrust forward, and his toes spread out. Meanwhile the room had become so full of people that you couldn't have dropped a pin. The policeman laughed all except one, who remained for a time, trying to drive out the people who came in from the stairs. Almost all Madame Lipovixel's lodgers had streamed in from the inner rooms of the flat. At first they were squeezed together in the doorway, but afterwards they overflowed into the room. Katerina Ivanovna flew into a fury. You might let him die in peace, at least, she shouted at the crowd. Is it a spectacle for you to gape at? With cigarettes. Cough, cough, cough. You might as well keep your hats on. And there is one in his hat. Get away. You should respect the dead, at least. Her cough choked her, but her reproaches were not without result. 
They evidently stood in some of Katerina Ivanovna. The lodgers, one after another, squeezed back into the doorway with that strange inner feeling of satisfaction which may be observed in the presence of a sudden accident. Even in those nearest and dearest to the victim, from which no living man is exempt, even in spite of the sincerest sympathy and compassion, voices outside were heard, however, speaking of the hospital and saying that they'd no business to make a disturbance here, no business to die, cried Katerina Ivanovna, and she was rushing to the door to vent her wrath upon them, but in the doorway came face to face with Madame Lipovixel, who had only just heard of the accident and ran in to restore order. She was a particularly quarrelsome and irresponsible German. Oh, my God! She cried, clasping her hands. Your husband drunken horses have trampled to the hospital with him. I am the landlady, Amalia Ludwigovna. I beg you to recollect what you are saying. Katerina Ivanovna began haughtily. She always took a haughty tone with the landlady that she might remember her place and even now could not deny herself this satisfaction. Amalia Ludwigovna, I have you once before told that you to call me Amalia Ludwigovna may not dare. I am Amalia Ivanovna. You are not Amalia Ivanovna, but Amalia Ludwigovna, and as I am not one of your despicable flatterers like Mr. Lebesyetnikov, who's laughing behind the door at this moment, a laugh and a cry of there at it again was in fact audible at the door, so I shall always call you Amalia Ludwigovna, though I fail to understand why you dislike that name. You can see for yourself what has happened to Samyan Zafrovich. He is dying. I beg you to close that door at once and to admit no one. Let him at least die in peace. Or I warn you the Governor-General himself shall be informed of your conduct tomorrow. The prince knew me as a girl. He remembers Semyon Zavarovich well and has often been a benefactor to him. Everyone knows that Semyon Zavarovich had many friends and protectors, whom he abandoned himself from an honorable pride, knowing his unhappy weakness. But now, she pointed to Raskolnikov. A generous young man has come to our assistance, who has wealth and connections and whom Semyon Zavarovich has known from a child. You may rest assured, Amalia Ludwigovna, all this was uttered with extreme rapidity, getting quicker and quicker, but a cough suddenly cut short Katerina Ivanovna's eloquence. At that instant the dying man recovered consciousness and uttered a groan. She ran to him. The injured man opened his eyes and without recognition or understanding gazed at Raskolnikov who was bounding over him. He drew deep, slow, painful breaths. Blood oozed at the corners of his mouth and drops of perspiration came out on his forehead. Not recognizing Raskolnikov, he began looking round uneasily. Katerina Ivanovna looked at him with a sad but stern face and tears trickled from her eyes. My God, his whole chest is crushed. How he is bleeding, she said in despair. We must take off his clothes. Turn a little, Semyon Zarevich, if you can, she cried to him. Marmaladov recognized her. A priest, he articulated huskily. Katerina Ivanovna walked to the window, laid her head against the window frame and exclaimed in despair, Oh, cursed life. A priest, the dying man said again after a moment's silence. They've gone for him. Katerina Ivanovna shouted to him. He obeyed her shout and was silent. With sad and timid eyes he looked for her. She returned and stood by his pillow. He seemed a little easier but not for long. Soon his eyes rested on little Lida, his favorite, who was shaking in the corner, as though she were in a fit, and staring at him with her wondering childish eyes. Ah, he signed towards her uneasily. He wanted to say something. What now? cried Katerina Ivanovna. Barefoot, barefoot, he muttered, indicating with frenzied eyes the child's bare feet. Be silent, Katerina Ivanovna cried irritably. You know why she is barefooted. Thank God, the doctor, exclaimed Raskolnikov, relieved. The doctor came in, a precise little old man, a German, looking about him mistrustfully. He went up to the sick man, took his pulse, carefully felt his head and with the help of Katerina Ivanovna he unbuttoned the blood-stained shirt and bared the injured man's chest. It was gashed, crushed and fractured. Several ribs on the right side were broken. On the left side, just over the heart was a large, sinister-looking yellowish-black breezy a cruel kick from the horse's hoof. The doctor frowned. The policeman told him that he was caught in the wheel and turned round with it for thirty yards on the road. 
It's wonderful that he has recovered consciousness, the doctor whispered softly to Raskolnikov. What do you think of him? He asked. He will die immediately. Is there really no hope? Not the faintest. He is at the last gasp. His head is badly injured. To him, I could bleed him if you like, but it would be useless. He is bound to die within the next five or ten minutes. Better bleed him then, if you like. But I warn you it will be perfectly useless. At that moment other steps were heard, the crowd in the passage parted, and the priest, a little, grey, old man, appeared in the doorway bearing the sacrament. A policeman had gone for him at the time of the accident. The doctor changed places with him, exchanging glances with him. Raskolnikov begged the doctor to remain a little while. He shrugged his shoulders and remained. All stepped back. The confession was soon over. The dying man probably understood little. He could only utter indistinct broken sounds. Katerina Ivanovna took little leader, lifted the boy from the chair, knelt down in the corner by the stove and made the children kneel in front of her. The little girl was still trembling, but the boy, kneeling on his little bare knees, lifted his hand rhythmically, crossing himself with precision and bowed down, touching the floor with his forehead, which seemed to afford him a special satisfaction. Katerina Ivanovna bit her lips and held back her tears. She prayed, too, now and then pulling straight the boy's shirt, and managed to cover the girl's bare shoulders with a kerchief, which she took from the chest without rising from her knees or ceasing to pray. Meanwhile the door from the inner rooms was opened inquisitively again. In the passage the crowd of spectators from all the flats on the staircase grew denser and denser, but they did not venture beyond the threshold. A single candle and lighted up the scene. At that moment Palenka forced her way through the crowd at the door. She came in panting from running so fast, took off her kerchief, looked for her mother, went up to her and said, She's coming. I met her in the street. Her mother made her kneel beside her. Timidly and noiselessly a young girl made her way through the crowd, and strange was her appearance in that room, in the midst of want, rags, death and despair. She, too, was in rags. Her attire was all the cheapest, but decked out in gutter finery of a special stamp, unmistakably betraying its shameful purpose. Sonia stopped short in the doorway and looked about her bewildered, unconscious of everything. She forgot her fourth hand, gaudy silk dress, so unseemly here with its ridiculous long train, and her immense crinoline that filled up the whole doorway, and her light-colored shoes and the parasol she brought with her, though it was no use at night, and the absurd round straw hat with its flaring flame-colored feather. Under this rakishly tilted hat was a pale, frightened little face with lips parted and eyes staring in terror. Sonia was a small thin girl of eighteen with fair hair, rather pretty, with wonderful blue eyes. She looked intently at the bed and the priest. She was out of breath with running. At last whispers, some words in the crowd probably, reached her. She looked down and took a step forward into the room, still keeping close to the door. The service was over. Katerina Ivanovna went up to her husband again. The priest stepped back and turned to say a few words of admonition and consolation to Katerina Ivanovna on leaving. What am I to do with these? She interrupted sharply and irritably, pointing to the little ones. God is merciful, look to the Most High for succor, the priest began. Ach, he is merciful, but not to us. That's a sin, a sin, madam, observed the priest, shaking his head. And isn't that a sin, cried Katerina Ivanovna, pointing to the dying man. Perhaps those who have involuntarily caused the accident will agree to compensate you, at least for the loss of his earnings. You don't understand, cried Katerina Ivanovna angrily waving her hand. And why should they compensate me? Why? He was drunk and threw himself under the horses. What earnings? He brought us in nothing but misery. He drank everything away, the drunkard. He robbed us to get drink. He wasted their lives and mine for drink. And thank God he's dying. One last to keep. You must forgive in the hour of death. That's a sin. Madam, such feelings are a great sin. Katerina Ivanovna was busy with the dying man. She was giving him water wiping the blood and sweat from his head, setting his pillow straight, and had only turned now and then for a moment to address the priest. Now she flew at him almost in a frenzy. Ah, father, that's words and only words. 
forgive. If he'd not been run over, he'd have come home today drunk and his only shirt dirty and in rags and he'd have fallen asleep like a log. And I should have been sousing and rinsing till daybreak, washing his rags and the children's and then drying them by the window and as soon as it was daylight I should have been darning them. That's how I spend my nights. What's the use of talking of forgiveness? I have forgiven as it is. A terrible hollow cough interrupted her words. She put her handkerchief to her lips and showed it to the priest, pressing her other hand to her aching chest. The handkerchief was covered with blood. The priest bowed his head and said nothing. Marmolodov was in the last agony. He did not take his eyes off the face of Katerina Ivanovna, who was bending over him again. He kept trying to say something to her. He began moving his tongue with difficulty and articulating indistinctly. But Katerina Ivanovna, understanding that he wanted to ask her forgiveness, called peremptorily to him, Be silent. No need. I know what you want to say. And the sick man was silent, but at the same instant his wandering eyes strayed to the doorway and he saw Sonia. Till then he had not noticed her. She was standing in the shadow in a corner. Who's that? Who's that? He said suddenly in a thick gasping voice, in agitation, turning his eyes in horror towards the door where his daughter was standing and trying to sit up. Lie down, lie down, cried Katerina Ivanovna. With unnatural strength he had succeeded in propping himself on his elbow. He looked wildly and fixedly for some time on his daughter, as though not recognizing her. He had never seen her before in such attire. Suddenly he recognized her, crushed and ashamed in her humiliation and gaudy finery, meekly awaiting her turn to say goodbye to her dying father. His face showed intense suffering. Sonia, daughter, forgive. He cried, and he tried to hold out his hand to her. But losing his balance, he fell off the sofa, face downwards on the floor. They rushed to pick him up, they put him on the sofa, but he was dying. Sonia with a faint cry ran up, embraced him and remained so without moving. He died in her arms, he's got what he wanted, Katerina Ivanovna cried, seeing her husband's dead body. Well, what's to be done now? How am I to bury him? What can I give them tomorrow to eat? Raskolnikov went up to Katerina Ivanovna. Katerina Ivanovna, he began, last week your husband told me all his life and circumstances. Believe me, he spoke of you with passionate reverence. From that evening, when I learnt how devoted he was to you all and how he loved and respected you especially. Katerina Ivanovna, in spite of his unfortunate weakness, from that evening we became friends. Allow me now to do something to repay my debt to my dead friend. Here are twenty roubles. I think and if that can be of any assistance to you, then I in short, I will come again. I will be sure to come again. I shall, perhaps, come again tomorrow. Goodbye. And he went quickly out of the room, squeezing his way through the crowd to the stairs. But in the crowd he suddenly jostled against Nikodim Farmich, who had heard of the accident and had come to give instructions in person. They had not met since the scene at the police station, but Nikodim Farmich knew him instantly. Ah, oh, is that you? He asked him. He's dead, answered Raskolnikov. The doctor and the priest have been, all as it should have been. Don't worry the poor woman too much. She is in consumption as it is. Try and cheer her up. If possible, you are a kind-hearted man. I know he added with a smile, looking straight in his face. But you are spattered with blood, observed Nikodim Farmich, noticing in the lamplight some fresh stains on Raskolnikov's waistcoat. Yes, I'm covered with blood, Raskolnikov said with a peculiar air. Then he smiled, nodded and went downstairs. He walked down slowly and deliberately, feverish but not conscious of it, entirely absorbed in a new overwhelming sensation of life and strength that surged up suddenly within him. This sensation might be compared to that of a man condemned to death who has suddenly been pardoned. Halfway down the staircase he was overtaken by the priest on his way home. Raskolnikov let him pass, exchanging a silent greeting with him. He was just descending the last steps when he heard rapid footsteps behind him. Someone overtook him. It was Palenka. She was running after him, calling wait. Wait. He turned round. She was at the bottom of the staircase and stopped short a step above him. A dim light came in from the yard. Raskolnikov could distinguish the child's thin but pretty little face, looking at him with a bright childish smile. She had run after him with a message which he was evidently glad to give. Tell me, 
What is your name, and where do you live? She said hurriedly in a breathless voice. He laid both hands on her shoulders and looked at her with a sort of rapture. It was such a joy to him to look at her. He could not have said why. Who sent you? Sister Sonia sent me, answered the girl, smiling still more brightly. I knew it was Sister Sonia sent you. Mama sent me. To when Sister Sonia was sending me, Mama came up, too, and said run fast, Palanka. Do you love Sister Sonia? I love her more than anyone, Palanka answered with a peculiar earnestness, and her smile became graver. And will you love me? By way of answer he saw the little girl's face approaching him, her full lips naively held out to kiss him. Suddenly her arms as thin as sticks held him tightly, her head rested on his shoulder, and the little girl wept softly, pressing her face against him. I am sorry for father, she said a moment later, raising her tear-stained face and brushing away the tears with her hands. It's nothing but misfortunes now, she added suddenly with that peculiarly sedate air which children try hard to assume when they want to speak like grown-up people. Did your father love you? He loved Lida most, she went on very seriously without a smile, exactly like grown-up people. He loved her because she is little and because she is ill, too. And he always used to bring her presents, but he taught us to read and me grammar and scripture, too, she added with dignity. And mother never used to say anything, but we knew that she liked it and father knew it, too. And mother wants to teach me French, for it's time my education began. And do you know your prayers? Of course, we do. We knew them long ago. I say my prayers to myself, as I am a big girl now, but Colia and Lida say them aloud with mother. First they repeat the Ave Maria and then another prayer, Lord, forgive and bless Sister Sonia, and then another, Lord, forgive and bless our second father. For our elder father is dead and this is another one, but we do pray for the other as well. Palenka, my name is Rodian. Pray sometimes for me, too. And thy servant Rodion, nothing more. I'll pray for you all the rest of my life. The little girl declared hotly, and suddenly smiling again she rushed at him and hugged him warmly once more. Raskolnikov told her his name and address and promised to be sure to come next day. The child went away quite enchanted with him. It was past ten when he came out into the street. In five minutes he was standing on the bridge at the spot where the woman had jumped in. Enough, he pronounced resolutely and triumphantly. I've done with fancies, imaginary terrors and phantoms. Life is real. Haven't I lived just now? My life has not yet died with that old woman. The kingdom of heaven to heron now enough. Madam, leave me in peace. Now for the reign of reason and light and of will and of strength and now we will see. We will try our strength. He added defiantly, as though challenging some power of darkness. And I was ready to consent to live in a square of space. I am very weak at this moment, but I believe my illness is all over. I knew it would be over when I went out. By the way, Pochinkov's house is only a few steps away. I certainly must go to Razumahin even if it were not close by let him win his bet. Let us give him some satisfaction, to no matter. Strength, strength is what one wants, you can get nothing without it, and strength must be won by strength it's what they don't know. He added proudly and self-confidently and he walked with flagging footsteps from the bridge. Pride and self-confidence grew continually stronger in him. He was becoming a different man every moment. What was it had happened to work this revolution in him? He did not know himself. Like a man catching at a straw, he suddenly felt that he, too, could live, that there was still life for him, that his life had not died with the old woman. Perhaps he was into greater hurry with his conclusions, but he did not think of that. But I did ask her to remember thy servant Rodian in her prayers. The idea struck him. Well, that was in case of emergency, he added and left himself at his boyish celly. He was in the best of spirits. He easily found Razumahin. The new lodger was already known at Pochinkov's and the porter at once showed him the way. Halfway upstairs he could hear the noise and animated conversation of a big gathering of people. The door was wide open on the stairs. He could hear exclamations and discussion. Razumahin's room was fairly large. The company consisted of fifteen people. Raskolnikov stopped in the entry, where two of the landlady's servants were busy behind a screen with two samovars, bottles, plates and dishes of pie and savories, brought up from the landlady's kitchen. 
Raskolnik of Sentin for Razumihin. He ran out delighted. At the first glance, it was apparent that he had had a great deal to drink, and, though no amount of liquor made Razumihin quite drunk, this time he was perceptibly affected by it. Listen, Raskolnikov hastened to say, I've only just come to tell you you've won your bet and that no one really knows what may not happen to him. I can't come in, I'm so weak that I shall fall down directly. And so good evening and goodbye. Come and see me tomorrow. Do you know what? I'll see you home. If you say you're weak yourself, you must and your visitors. Who is the curly-headed one who has just peeped out? He, goodness only knows. Some friend of uncle's, I expect. Or perhaps he has come without being invited. I'll leave uncle with them. He is an invaluable person. Pity I can't introduce you to him now. But confound them all now. They won't notice me. And I need a little fresh air. For you've come just in the nick of time and other two minutes. And I should have come to blows. They are talking such a lot of wild stuff. You simply can't imagine what man will say. Though why shouldn't you imagine? Don't we talk nonsense ourselves? And let them that's the way to learn not to. Wait a minute, I'll fetch Zosimov. Zosimov pounced upon Raskolnikov almost greedily. He showed a special interest in him. Soon his face brightened. You must go to bad at once, he pronounced, examining the patient as far as he could, and take something for the night. Will you take it? I got it ready some time ago, a powder. Two, if you like, answered Raskolnikov. The powder was taken at once. It's a good thing you are taking him home. Observed Sosimov to Razumahin, we shall see how he is tomorrow. Today he's not at all amiss a considerable change since the afternoon. Live and learn do you know what Sosimov whispered to me when we were coming out? Razumahin blurted out as soon as they were in the street. I won't tell you everything, brother, because they're such fools. Sosimov told me to talk freely to you on the way and get you to talk freely to me and afterwards I am to tell him about it, for he's got a notion in his head that you are med or close on it. Only fancy, in the first place, you three times the brains he has, in the second, if you are not mad, you needn't care a hang that he has got such a wild idea, and thirdly, that piece of beef whose specialty is surgery has gone mad on mantle diseases, and what's brought him to this conclusion about you is your conversation today with Zamatov. Zamatov told you all about it. Yes, and he did well. Now I understand what it all means and so does Zamatov. Well, the fact is, Roger, the point is I am a little drunk now. But that's no matter. The point is that this idea you understand was just being hatched in their brains you understand. That is, no one ventured to say it aloud because the idea is too absurd and especially since the arrest of that painter, that bubble's burst and gone forever. But why are they such fools? I gave Zamatov a bit of a threshing at the time that's between ourselves. Brother, please don't let out a hint that you know of it. I've noticed he is a ticklish subject. It was at loose Ivanovna's. But today, today it's all cleared up. That Ilya Petrovich is at the bottom of it. He took advantage of your fainting at the police station, but he is ashamed of it himself now. I know that Raskolnikov listened greedily. Razumahin was drunk enough to talk to freely. I fainted then because it was so close and the smell of paint, said Raskolnikov. No need to explain that. And it wasn't the paint only. The fever had been coming on for a month. Zosimov testifies to that. But how crushed that boy is now, you wouldn't believe. I am not worth his little finger, he says. Yours, he means. He has good feelings at times, brother. But the lesson, the lesson you gave him today in the Pallady Crystal, that was too good for anything. You frightened him at first, you know, he nearly went into convulsions. You almost convinced him again of the truth of all that hideous nonsense, and then you suddenly lip it out your tongue at him. Other now, what do you make of it? It was perfect. He is crushed, annihilated now. It was masterly. By Jove, it's what they deserve. Ah, that I wasn't there. He was hoping to see you awfully. Porphyry, too, wants to make your acquaintance, oh. He too, but why did they put me down as mad? Oh, not mad. I must have said too much. Brother, what struck him, you see, was that only that subject seemed to interest you. Now it's clear why it did interest you. Knowing all the circumstances and how that irritated you and worked in with your illness, I am a little drunk. Brother, only, confound him. He has some idea of his own, I tell you. He's mad on mental diseases. 
but don't you mind him for half a minute, both were silent. Listen, Razumahin, began Raskolnikov, I want to tell you plainly, I've just been at a deathbed. A clerk who died I gave them all my money, and besides I've just been kissed by someone who, if I had killed anyone, would just the same, in fact I saw someone else there with a flame-colored feather, but I am talking nonsense, I am very weak. Support me, we shall be at the stairs directly, what's the matter? What's the matter with you? Razumahin asked anxiously. I am a little giddy, but that's not the point. I'm so sad, so sad like a woman. Look, what's that? Look, look, what is it? Don't you see? A light in my room, you see. Through the crack they were already at the foot of the last flight of stairs, at the level of the landlady's door, and they could, as a fact, see from below that there was a light in Raskolnikov's garret. Queer, Nastasya, perhaps, observed Razumahin. She is never in my room at this time and she must be in bed long ago, but I don't care. Goodbye. What do you mean? I am coming with you, we'll come in together. I know we're going in together, but I want to shake hands here and say goodbye to you here. So give me your hand, goodbye. What's the matter with you, Roger? Nothing come along, you shall be witness. They began mounting the stairs, and the idea struck Razumahin that perhaps Sarsimov might be right after all. Ah, I've upset him with my chatter, he muttered to himself. When they reached the door, they heard voices in the room. What is it? cried Razumahin. Raskolnikov was the first to open the door. He flung it wide and stood still in the doorway, dumbfounded. His mother and sister were sitting on his sofa and had been waiting an hour and a half for him. Why had he never expected, never thought of them, though the news that they had started, won their way and would arrive immediately, had been repeated to him only that day. They had spent that hour and a half plying Nastasia with questions. She was standing before them and had told them everything by now. They were beside themselves with alarm when they heard of his running away today, ill and as they understood from her story, delirious. Good heavens, what had become of him? Both had been weeping, both had been in anguish for that hour and a half. A cry of joy, of ecstasy, greeted Raskolnikov's entrance. Both rushed to him, but he stood like one dead. A sudden intolerable sensation struck him like a thunderbolt. He did not lift his arms to embrace them, he could not. His mother and sister clasped him in their arms, kissed him, laughed and cried. He took a step, tottered and fell to the ground, fainting. Anxiety, cries of horror, moans Razumahin who was standing in the doorway flew into the room, seized the sick man in his strong arms and in a moment had him on the sofa. It's nothing, nothing. He cried to the mother and sister it's only a faint, a mere trifle. Only just now the doctor said he was much better, that he is perfectly well. Water, see, he is coming to himself, he is all right again and seizing Downia by the arm so that he almost dislocated it. He made her bend down to see that he is all right again. The mother and sister looked on him with emotion and gratitude, as their providence. They had heard already from Nastasia all that had been done for their Rudyard during his illness by this very competent young man, as Pulcheria Alexandrovna Raskolnikov called him that evening in conversation with Downia. 